Welcome to the Galen Trombley Show. Be sure to subscribe, review, and share the episode. You can follow me on social media at Galen Trombley. I hope you enjoy the show. Greetings. Please hold for a very important message. Light speed sequence initiated. How may I help you? Bonjour. Security breach. The truth shall set you free. <laughs> awesome. It's a miracle. Mission complete. Thank you. Have a nice day. Welcome, everybody. Episode 233 of the Galen Trombley Show. My guest today, she is a returning guest, but she's like one-fifth or one-sixth of a returning guest because the only time you were on, you were with a group of people um, from the company, and I've had your husband on multiple times. I absolutely love Dave. Um, We'll have Dave back on, so I'm sure he might listen to a little bit of this and we will have them back on, but um, I haven't had you on solo, and I find that you warrant a full solo podcast, um, and I think that, obviously, I'm a big fan of both you and your husband, but I think, again, we're going to dive deeper, in, a little more into you, and you and <laughs> you might be the most prepared person I've ever had. <laughs> Jen kept walking in and like handing oh, more, me more awesome. sheets, and I'm like, I, I'm like, this is a two-hour podcast, but we might go eight hours today. Who oh knows, gosh, folks? But I could go forever. My, my, my guest today is Liz Coyer, CEO, co-founder of Coyer Staffing in Plattsburgh. Yes. And about a lot of cool things that we'll get to. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you for having me and for all your kind words. I'm honored to be here. I was shocked um, when I got the email from Jen, but pleased as well. So (laughs) thank you for that. Um, And first off, have you bought a Tesla yet? No. (laughs) <laughs> has your finger been like on because i bug dave every time i see him is have you like how close have you guys gotten to getting one? Oh, david is probably close every single day does he like go all the way to the checkout and then just like takes off I the think screen he does i think he does he's, he might keep that he's me. got the interior he's got the collar <laughs> he knows what he wants but oh he knows exactly what he wants uh, but i think he gets it's a little bit impulsive right now so he's saying i have to wait have to hold off a little bit longer just but you driving people, around town doesn't help. If he uh, <laughs> if he orders it now though, it's like a two month window of waiting. So he kind of like builds up that that right. uh, he he can have buyer remorse for two months and it'll come in and be like, hey, it's great. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so it, for people that don't know you, um, who are you? Obviously, Coyer Staffing. I think a lot of people have noticed Coyer Staffing, and you know, you, you guys are very involved in the community. And obviously, um, I think you know from at least my understanding of everything, you guys seem like you guys have a, a very prominent business in town i'm sure like any small business i'm sure most days may not feel like that but you guys i think do a great job and but again people that don't, don't know you um give us kind of some background on you and how you came to to be in the position you are today okay uh <laughs> and you can look at all your notes <laughs> that, <laughs> that's also a question that could have a long answer or a very brief one um David and I started Courier Staffing in 2016, so we just celebrated seven years in business, which is just wild. Um, feels like yesterday, quite honestly. Um, but David spent a lot of time, his most of his career, in staffing and recruiting. And uh, when we found ourselves in a position where we needed to figure out what are we going to do next, it seemed very natural to say, well, pretty sure I know what we're going to do. It's just how we're going to do it that we didn't know. Um, so career staffing, you know, was developed on David's experience, my interest, and uh, a drive that we had to just help the community where there were some voids that we saw. Um, and, uh, and so here we are today, seven years down the road. So when you, um, did you had any background in recruiting? I had no background in recruiting. However, um, interestingly, about somewhere in the year prior. Actually, let's, can you pull that down just a little bit closer to you? Yep. There you go. Yeah. All right. We, we want that radio sound. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere in the year prior to our starting courier staffing, um, I had started training with a friend of his out of Chicago who had his own um, staffing agency. And I was learning the direct hire side of recruiting. And so I had a tiny bit of experience trained by one of David's good friends. And, um, and I built upon that, of course. So what was it like going into business with a spouse (laughs) we get asked that all the time um to be honest we love it i feel like i have a better relationship with david today than i would otherwise Mm -hmm. we spend time together however we 
also go in different directions. Some days we hardly see each other. But, you know, being in business together, it's it's really amazing to know that your partner is on the same page as you mm-hmm. and you have a trust with that individual. If there's ever any question about anything, you know that they're going to come to you and I know that I'm going to go to him. Um, you know, I think that there's no better match for myself in business. And I know David talks to it the same way. So. Yeah, I think uh, what well, I think the hard part is when you have a business partner, because like business is like a very... For people that own businesses, it's a very intimate thing because you you live and breathe it all day long, and it's like a it's like a well in your case a third child, you know, it's like there, and you got to keep like it's a living breathing part of your life. And sometimes if you have partnerships, it's like you need a hundred like you got to be a hundred percent. There's loyalty. There's being on the same page, and I find that naturally, like my wife is my closest conf- confidant in my life yeah. and the closest person. It's like to me, you know that there's no. Um, like it's going to be a stronger bond. Mm-hmm. So you don't have like, you know, and I think business sometimes like you hear people doing stuff or maybe, I don't say backstabbing, but things happen and people drift apart. And it's easier to separate from a business partner than it is from like your spouse. So, sure. so I think like you guys, like I said, you, you're, you're uh, no matter what happens, you're like, ah, I can't get away from this guy. He's going to be there. So, um, but now like day to day, like you're the CEO or C- CEO, Dave is a COO, right? That's right. And how do you guys work and between the vision and the execution and, and, you know, just the day to day. Cause I mean, you're both on like the leadership obviously, but yes. Um, it's a great question. We, we bounce everything off of one another. I tend to, you know what I'm going to say, I tend to have the vision, but I know that anybody that knows David knows that he also has the vision. Mm-hmm. David is very creative and comes up with ideas every day. Um, every day. And I think I'm a little bit of the filter at times with him um, because he comes up with wonderful ideas. It's just a matter of how do you execute on all of these wonderful, amazing ideas mm-hmm. and which ones are ones that are really tangible that we can grab a hold of and, and act on today. So for me, I think when I say I see the vision, I'm looking further out mm-hmm. and David is looking at today. And so, you know, I think that in my role, I'm looking where are we going? How are we going to get there? And then I'm back in the operations side executing. And David is constantly bringing us um, the the experience, the educational component. He reads, he listens to podcasts. Mm-hmm. He probably has listened to almost all of yours. I don't know. I'm imagining so because he's, he's always. A guy, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so he's just a wealth of information and comes when we have great ideas or when I have a vision, we together figure out how we're going to execute and act on it. Um, is it hard? Like, because it went with vision, I find that people that are very entrepreneurial, you you get in a mindset and the creativity where like ideas come to you pretty pretty frequent. And I think the hardest part is like you said, the filtering or getting rid of the shiny objects or the squirrel moment where <laughs> yes. your head's you know bouncing around. But um, do you guys have like a filtration process of hey, we have you know twenty great ideas, but like what one do we really pick and focus on and, and put your energy? Because again, it's to execute, you, you really can only do maybe one two things at a time. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we we tend to bounce a lot of ideas around before we really settle on an idea that we're going to run with. Mm-hmm. Um, this sounds silly, but we walk our dogs every single morning <laughs> and seven days a week. And we do a lot of talking and thinking out loud and kind of brainstorming on that walk, mm-hmm. which always carries on to like, then you're going in different directions, you're showering, you're bringing the kids to school, you're getting to the office. And then it's like, by the time we get to the office, we know we're kind of on the same page, we're running with the same idea, and we've now developed our own thoughts on it, and we kind of meet back together to figure it out from there. So that whole, everything's a daily process, it's communication. Everything. <laughs> uh, now, when when you guys are, say you're going for a walk and, and you know, you're know you discussing stuff, are, are you guys able to separate business from, like, is it always consuming? Because I know, again, I... I'm constantly thinking about the business. I mean, I try not to, but mm-hmm. I'd be lying if it's not no. in my head all the time. It just lives there. So yep. um, are you guys good at kind of compartmentalizing it or, you know, decompressing from that? Or or do you just like, hey, we absolutely love this and we'd rather talk about this than really anything else? I think I'm more like you. I will think about it 24-7. Um, it never goes away. I'm constantly thinking about either something that happened, how to do it better next time, what we're doing, um, you know, a situation that might we might be presented with at that moment. And David 
is able to say, all right, we need to put that aside and let's focus on something else. So it's really a partnership. I mean, he pulls me out of it when I need to be pulled out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think occasionally at times, if I see him going down that road, I can remove my own thoughts and and go with him and pull him out of it, knowing that he needs that from me. So it really, I, I don't know how we do it. There's no secret science. We just, it works very well for us. Um, have you guys worked together before this? No. no. Um, so what, what, I guess, going from, because you have a, well, I'm going to dive back into a lot more like your previous work experience, but what made you decide to go in with, you know, with David and this and the choir staffing and to start this whole thing from what you guys did previously? I think um, it's it's a tough question to answer. We I don't have a clear answer for that. Um, we just knew that we wanted to do something together, and we kind of knew that always. To be honest, that's how I said when we before we started courier staffing. I started um, training with a friend of his. We knew we were going to go into business at some point together. Uh, we just didn't know what it was going to be, mm-hmm. and. I think the reason we knew that is just because we did get along so well. I'll be honest, like there was a part of me that thought in my life, I'm never going to marry anybody. I'm never going to be happy enough with some other person in my life. I kind of like my life. I like my freedom. I like flying by the seat of my pants. And then I met David. And, you know, I think I can't speak for him, but I feel like he felt the same way. Mm -hmm. And whether it was business, raising a family, um, renovating houses, traveling, you name it, we do it well together. Um, so I was going to say, cause that, like, I, I think of my wife and I'm, I don't know, we bounced, I, I vent to her and she vents to me and it's kind of like, it's a sounding board, but I, and you, you know, I think we're far enough removed from our two lines of work that it's, you're seeing it more from like a, a, a far away, maybe whole view, view versus like the day to day. Um, I don't know if we could work i mean i'm sure we could but we're both we're both stubborn she's more competitive than i am and like i'm competitive but she's like sports competitive and like competition competitive where i'm more internally competitive Mm -hmm. um but i find like from a parenting perspective or a spousal i feel we have a very good relationship and partnership and we we talked about this the other night have you ever had it when you're just like laying in bed and can't go to sleep and next thing you know, two hours went by and you're just talking about a bunch of oh, just yeah. random stuff. And <laughs> we had one of those nights and next thing we know, it's like one in the morning and we're just exhausted. And, but we, uh, it was kind of the idea of like, Hey, we divide and conquer and we don't really, we just kind of like have settled into roles in our household, which, mm-hmm. you know, she takes care of X, Y, and Z and I take care of A, B, and C and it just ends up working for us. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if work would be, I don't know. I don't know how that would be, <laughs> but I feel like it's good that we don't work together. Sure. And I don't know if that's, that's why I'm like, you You guys always seem like you have a very good partnership. And I know there's some people that ha- that work with family and you might see like a family ownership. You know, I'm thinking of like, like even like a Warren Tire where there's mm-hmm. multiple generations of people working and, you know, they make it work. And yeah. I mean, even here, me and my dad work, but we don't, we're not at day to day like you and David are. Like mm-hmm. I, I see my dad maybe once a week in here, you know, mm-hmm. so it's more... Um, like I, Jen's more my sounding board every day, yeah. which she's probably, I don't know if you ever talked to Jen. She's like, God, Gillen, stop talking. But, um, she's so, great. so <laughs> yes, I, I, I definitely like Jen. She's, she's a lot of fun, but, uh, yeah. so going back, are you originally from the area? I am from the area. Um, and I will make one more comment on what you were just talking about with your wife and you. I think more people say that to us than not. More people feel that way, that they couldn't work with their spouse, mm-hmm. that things are working very well, and they don't know that they want to throw that you know, into the works. Um, and I think that David and I have really good communication. I think if, if I, you know, yep. I don't love 100% of everything he says. Mm-hmm. He doesn't love 100% of everything I say or do. But we hold off and usually we'll talk with each other outside of that moment yeah. about whatever it was, you know, cool, so nice we're not in front of the of kids thing. or we're not in front of the office or, yeah. you know, we try not to be anyway. So yeah. at any rate, yes, I'm from Plattsburgh, but I just okay. had to say that I'm like, I think the communication is, is probably I, if there is a secret science, that's it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, well, most things in life are miscommunications or bad communication or, mm-hmm. you know, lack of communication. And I think, um, again, from a, um, a home life, I talk to Gina every day and i mean sometimes like we'll text throughout the day depending on like what it is but usually it's like are you picking up the kids are you doing this but but even when we go home it's just a lot of we talk all the time about stuff so right. which feels good because you're like you, we feel on the same page and 
I, I don't dread going to dinner or going for a car ride with her because we right. talk the whole time anyway. You know, so it's like you see those people that just stare at each other. I'm like, don't you yeah. guys talk to each other about anything? So, um, so you're originally from Plattsburgh. Did you go to PHS? I did. And then after PHS, I have some of these. I'm, I'm not going to cheat. I'll let you to describe them. But sure. Um, you ended up going to college afterwards. Yes, I did. And Brockport, Potsdam, and Mexico. Okay. So, so I'll let you unpack that. <laughs> So I went to Potsdam, um, SUNY Potsdam, but I did a study abroad program through SUNY Brockport, um, and then I did another one through SUNY Potsdam. So if you're looking at my background and it has both all of that, that's why. <laughs> so what? And you, so you have a, a BA in Spanish. I know. So how did you? <laughs> and you can speak Spanish. I can. Like still very fluent. Yes. Um. So, okay, so I got, I got some questions on second languages here. So did you go to college wanting to do Spanish? I did not. I thought I would probably go into something with science. I love okay. science, love chemistry, love math. Okay. You know, my mind works that way. I love puzzles. Okay. Um, and I just really thought that was where I was going. And then I was uh, maybe my second year in college, not sure what I was going to do, kind of. I don't really want to say flailing. I mean, I was fine, but I was not really loving everything. I, my parents were the ones to recognize this. I loved the social scene. Yep. And I loved some of my professors and living away from home was cool. But, um, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And so my dad said, listen, do a study abroad program. I don't care where you go. Just do it. Just do okay. something. Go somewhere. Experience life outside of the U.S. You know, live with a family. Make new friends. Just go. So I signed up for um, a study abroad program in Argentina. Okay. And I was two weeks away from the program, plane tickets bought, paperwork done, and I chickened out. <laughs> I said, really? I'm not going. I don't want to go. What were you about, 18, 19 at this yeah, time? Yeah, I was 18, I think. Okay. Yeah. Had and you ever been out of the country? I had only been to Mexico okay. while in Canada. And. First, I've been your big first time away from family. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would be the first time on my own away. Yep. So my dad said, "My I say my dad because that's who was kind of the push, but my mom was involved too, of course. Um, <clears throat> but they said, well, we've already paid the money, so you're going somewhere. <laughs> okay. So I looked and I went to the study abroad um, office on campus and I said, what am I going to do? And they said, well, there was a trip to Mexico that left like a week earlier. So... They said, we can transfer your money to that, but you got to be ready to go in a week. And I said, all right, fine, I'll do that. And to be honest, my mind was thinking, yeah, because if I chicken out now, I'm, I mean, it's only Mexico. I can get myself home, you know, I can figure home. that yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I went and I, I loved it. It was certainly um, a lot of adjusting and figuring out how to get around and how to, I mean, I didn't even know how to get a cab. I didn't speak the language. Um, they put me with a family who didn't speak English. Um, but I did have my first roommate was someone from New York City. And she made fun of me, kind of like you're doing with my notes. She but made she fun could... of my packing. And okay. <laughs> she had a backpack, I had a suitcase. and She could speak English. Know, she could speak English, yep. Okay. And uh, she had like three outfits with her, all black. And, you know, she was very um, introverted, happy to be on her own. And I'm ready to meet people and make friends and experience a new life and uh so it wasn't a good match <laughs> um so, so when you wow okay so what what drew you to argentina i'm gonna go to argentina we'll spend just a little bit sure. there so you go to Ar or you potentially argentina mm -hmm. did you just like throw it like a dart at the map and that's what it hit or did you have like a rhyme or reason for it i for some reason i had in my head i always wanted to go to buenos aires okay. i just wanted to see it i wanted to be there and experience it and it was where i was going until it wasn't <laughs> um have you been there since no Okay, so it's still on the bucket list. It's still there. Okay, and it might be more fun now with knowing it would Spanish. Be, it, they sure. speak Spanish, right? Yeah. Okay, and then uh, where, where were you in Mexico? The first time I went, I lived in Cuernavaca, yeah. and it's right outside of Mexico City. Mexico City is kind of like central, yeah. mid central kind of. Um, Pretty much. And how many people were in that, that Ooh, city? Oh, I don't remember. I did know at one point in time. It's a, it's a pretty big city. In Mexico City, how? Oh, that, Mexico, Mexico City is one huge. of the biggest in the world, yes. right? Um, yes. So you obviously spent time, I'm guessing, in Mexico City? A lot of time in Mexico City. Um, so how, and you had zero Spanish before you left. Zero. Just high school Spanish and one year of college. 
<laughs> and and at what so at this point you still are not a Spanish major? No, no, I wasn't. In fact, I was on the plane, and there were some other students that because the school made the, the arrangements. I think we flew out of New York City, and there were some other students from SUNY schools that had used the Potsdam program, and they were at, on the plane with me, and they all had dictionaries, and they were all studying. And I'm looking like, why are these people studying? This is ridiculous. You know, I've taken Spanish in high school. I took a year in college. I'm fine. So I get there, and they had 20 levels that you could place into, and that's where you started. You had to take a test right when you got there for how much Spanish you know, and then they would place you at a level. Well, all those other SUNY students were in, like, levels 16, 17. I was placed in level one. <laughs> oh, so you like, were. I was at zero, zero. They were teaching me hola and how to count to three. And yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, Even though I knew a lot of that, I just bombed the test, I guess. So <laughs> so did you did you always plan to go to another country with a different language? Like how come you didn't go to like London or Ireland? Or... I know. I don't know. I think because I had traveled Mexico frequently with my family. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was a Spanish teacher. There's that. Okay. All right. Um, and he occasionally, when I was uh, growing up, he would bring students to Mexico with us. And so he would, you know, there were other chaperones and there were like high school students that would be on this trip. And for me, it was just a vacation, you know, a beach vacation. But we'd go see the ruins. We'd go see some cool things. But um, but I was always around it. So I thought, oh, I'm familiar with Spanish. That's an easy place. My parents are telling me to study abroad. That's what I'll do. I'll go someplace that speaks Spanish. So what what was like your first day rolling in there with with knowing hola. <laughs> like, could to get a cab? Like. Yeah, I was, I was pretty bummed when everybody else was. The, the advanced students were on a different campus even. So I was on a campus with all entry-level beginning students who didn't know any Spanish. And I felt like, okay, I know more than this. Like, I can get myself through this. So I did. I, I said every week, can I take a test and see if I can get to the next level? And they'd say, oh, okay, you can come take a test. But every week I, I excelled. I moved to the next level, next level, next level until I was at the same level as the people who I came in with. So they weren't advancing at the same rate because they started at a hard level. And I guess me starting at an earlier, easier level made it so that I became so, fluent more quickly. So how, um, like, for, so like, I'm assuming back in the 90s, you said 90s, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going by the year you graduated, so I'm guessing in the 90s. So. Yep. I'm assuming there's not as many English-speaking people in Mexico as there probably would be today. Right. So was it hard to find people that spoke English back then? Yes. People, there were some students that I would run into. Now, this is in Cuernavaca, um, my first time living there. There were some students who were, um, and by students, I mean like we'd run into maybe some college students or something around the area, and they spoke some broken English or they were learning English, and so they would try to use their English talking to us, and we were trying to use our Spanish to talk to them. But for the most part, there weren't a lot of English speaking. And like I said, the cabs or the grocery stores or just like trying to find some place to get a haircut. You know, I didn't know how to ask people. How do you spell Cuernavaca? Cuernavaca is C-U-E-R-N-A-V-A-C-A. -A -A. Right here? Yes. Okay. Oh, there we go. Just to give me a little more context as to where the heck this is in Spain. Population. Did you see it? I did, right? Um, metropolitan area oh. has 912,024 people. The municipality has 366, 321 inhabitants as of 2015. So who knows? Now. Probably a little bit more now. So it's it's a big city. Okay. Um, it, and, and I mean, yeah, obviously Spanish conquest. You have like the ruins and stuff. And that was, is that pretty prevalent in the cities? Like when you go through like a lot of the older cultures? Yes. Yep. It's very, it's beautiful. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Um, the different things that you can go to as, as a student, you know, as someone like wide eyed at everything you're seeing, mm -hmm. the, the history and the um, different celebrations that they have, but the culture, you know, they just, they have such a different way of living and celebrating family and, and their past and where they came from. Well, you see, um, like I went to Texas a couple of years ago, San Antonio, and it's very like mm -hmm. that Tex-Mex like culture. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a cool culture. I mean, yeah. totally different than what I'm used to, but yeah. uh, like the music and the, and the, the, the bright colors and mm -hmm. just like the food and people are oh, just yeah. like really in it. So I, again, I've, I think I've been to, 
I went somewhere in Mexico, but it was like I think on a cruise. Was, I think Philly was like over here, so I feel like I didn't really get like Mexico. We kind of like hung out. You got to like the tourist, a tourist uh, port, if you will. Yeah, yeah. We kind of <laughs> we kind of blew past. I don't even. It's somewhere over here, but um, Cozumel maybe or Cozumel. Cozumel is, that, is yeah. that it? Sounds right. Yeah. Um, is that it, Cozumel? Oh, yeah. I was even on the island. Oh, I just found out. It's a little island. <laughs> yes. Well, I wasn't even on the mainland. Okay. Then do, I've never been to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, but it's not far from Playa del Carmen in Cancun. You take a ferry over and it's right there. Oh, that's where Cancun is. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, so how long into the trip before you felt comfortable? Oh, gosh. Well, I moved families. I ended up settling with the third family that I lived with. <laughs> So, um, was that by your choice or did that they... was by my choice? So you by just say third... like, let's well, move out. Yeah. Okay. By the third family, I think the school was saying to me, okay, maybe it's not the families. Maybe it's you. <laughs> I'm like, no, I promise you it's not me. Um, but it was, you know, it was just the first one, the New York city, um, uh, roommate and the family had us living in a bungalow outside of their house. Okay. And, I was never going to learn Spanish that way, in my opinion. I mm-hmm. thought, gosh, this is going to be really hard. I'm not even seeing these people who speak Spanish. I'm with this this girl who doesn't like me and makes fun of me. And speaks only so, English. And speaks well, only English. Yeah. And she didn't really have a big interest in learning Spanish. Um, so then I moved. I told the school I wanted to move. And they moved me in with a roommate who I loved and um, am still friends with today. And she was from Watertown. Oh. And yeah, and she's wonderful. Um, but so she and I moved in with this family and she was in a similar situation. She was moving from a family that wasn't a good fit. And, um, and so we get to this new house and it's forever away from the school and we're walking to and from whether it's rain or shine and it was hot and there were construction sites and, you know, people whistling and and hollering at us, you know, two American girls walking back and forth when we shouldn't be at any time of day. (laughs) And, uh, and then that family also kind of kept us outside like they'd serve meals and they'd put us at a table outside (laughs) and so we're like this do you find this odd like we're here to live with this family and they're just pushing us outside every time they have meal time like they were it was family time for them and our time to be outside did they ever interact with you not really no except one time we had um because they obviously a, typically get paid right to have you there yeah. so i'm sure it's like a little money maker yeah a little so passive income stream <laughs> like just put them out back <laughs> exactly so but oh, there was pretty. one time isn't that pretty yeah it's a beautiful city it's the city of eternal spring i think if i remember correctly it's kind of up in the mountains a little bit yeah yeah um, but um so so how long before you could like you felt oh, like you could carry on a conversation yeah i think um probably about 6 to 8 weeks and i was wow. fairly fluent that's yeah. just by necessity. Yeah. Has it always... Absolutely. <laughs> so how you said you had three years roughly of Spanish before you hit this time? Yeah, yeah. I had all of you know high school. I guess you start in middle school, mm-hmm. and it was maybe every other day or something. And then high school was Spanish. I had my dad for a couple of years teaching me Spanish, but oh, he was a know. teacher at PHS. <laughs> yeah, he was. Okay. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, <laughs> I bet it was. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then, like I said, I had to think either a semester or two semesters in college. So I, but I was very basic. I had very beginner level Spanish. I just had a lot of vocabulary, and I tell people all the time who are trying to learn Spanish, um, just know a lot of vocabulary, because the grammar will come to you through speaking. People will happily correct you and help you with changing, you know, a verb into the right. Um, in, into the the right conjugation, you know, past tense, present tense, future, you know, whatever it's supposed to be. So um, I remember, so I took French from like fifth grade through 10th grade and I took one, I think one year of college. So I think it ended up being like almost seven years. And to this day, I don't know French that well. I can, like if I go up to Montreal and I can like read the signs and kind of understand it. Yeah. But which is wild that you like if you were to say like, hey, I'm going to throw you in like say Paris, mm-hmm. and like within two months you're going to be able to carry on multiple conversations oh, yeah. versus seven years of just because I was much of like I'm going to remember enough to pass the test, and my biggest issue wasn't even that like my memory was fine. I remember back like back then we had to take a Regents, and before we took the written part, we had to sit with our French teacher and we had to do an, an oral like test for it, and. I remember I ended up getting 
whatever it was when I sat down to take the written test, like the best I could do was a 95. Because mm-hmm. I had, like, I lost a ton of points on, like, relative to, like, you're sitting down on a test. I'm like, I already can barely scratch out an A on this. Right. And I I actually almost aced the written portion because I could, I remember I could write it. I could figure out, um, the, like, what do you reset? Like, the past tense and the, you know, the twos and boos and news yeah. and all that. And, but it was the, I couldn't understand it. So if someone spoke to me, mm-hmm. if I had, like, a, if I had, like, a transcription as they were talking, I would understand them, like, for the most part. For the life of me, I couldn't understand yep. accents. And even to this day, my accents are poor. I couldn't, um, like, I would pronounce it. And, like, my pronunciation was as English-speaking as you could get. But there <laughs> yeah. was really no flow. Yeah. If you were like, oh, English is a beautiful, or French is a beautiful language until they hear me speak it. And right. Like, Ooh. Like, <laughs> yeah, stick with English. Did but, you ever play any instruments growing up? Um, I played French horn mm-hmm. for, like, two years, three years maybe. And then that's pretty much it. I dabbled with guitar in college, but uh-huh. yeah, nothing. Could you play by ear? Oh, God, no. No. See, I think no. for me, I couldn't, I wasn't so hot on reading the music. I always played instruments, but I didn't really love reading, but I loved hearing a sound and trying to play the sound. Okay. And so I feel like that might have come into play, play with saxophone? my, um, no, my son did. That's probably why I did I, that. I, I was going to say your hands. <laughs> I, was sa- I'm like, I played play flute okay, a little bit. That's better. <laughs> and I played piano. So that might be this. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, that might be, I think I tried violin at one point, but again, I didn't like reading the music. So I just wanted to play. I just wanted to listen to something and try to mimic it. Can you still play those instruments? I probably could. Okay. Maybe not violin. Probably more. I was gonna say probably more piano. Yeah, piano. We have a piano at our house. I never. It's out of tune, and I never really play it. But I can jump on it if I want to. Um, <laughs> that, that's my guitar and like I have a basic understanding of guitar. I have no understanding of piano. Mm-hmm. And we have a keyboard. So my wife used to play, and that's when life maybe gets a little less crazy with kids and stuff. That, that would be a hobby that I would try yeah. to pick up. And um, I, I love music. I love listening to music. I love live music. And then I'm like, why can't I just play some of it? Like, I don't want to perform it, but just like for fun. I know. I know. My son plays the guitar. He started playing bass and then, well, it was upright bass. Then it was bass guitar. He has a guitar, um, electric guitar, and he can play and he can just, you know, be in his bedroom and playing. And so I always say to him now that he's in college, I'm like, you should just find a friend and like start something you know just play start. some gigs here and there so i was gonna say every, i think every band people like starting college at some some you know, right a couple guys playing in a dorm room or whatever <laughs> it takes off um so the, you know ta- talking to people like how from like a second like i still want to stay not stay in the spanish for a mm-hmm. sec so when you were listening to another language how what do you find the best way to learn is it just full immersion and just kind of like you know trial by fire and just figure it out as you go i think absolutely okay. and like i said maybe learning a lot of vocabulary so if I was going to set my mind today on like, I need to learn German, mm-hmm. I would probably, not knowing what anybody else would say, but just from my experience, mm-hmm. I would learn a lot of vocabulary, just straight words that I know I want to be able to say. So like table, computer, yeah. phone. Yeah. Gotcha. Bathroom. Okay. All right. Because <laughs> uh-huh. really, if you're just like bathroom, people would be like, that way. Right. right. Like nobody says bathroom <laughs> to you and probably right. like, what about the bathroom? You like the bathroom? It yeah. looks nice, doesn't it? Yeah. Like directions, maybe mm-hmm. right, left, okay. straight, you know. Um. And then I guess how hard was it to understand like the accent of like, cause is Mexican Spanish different than like Spain Spanish? Yes. Okay. Yep. They use a, a different dialect. They have a different sound. Some of the letters are different. Okay. Um, they use a TH instead of the S sound sometimes, not really for S, but more for C. Um, okay. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit different and they use, um, in grammar, they use like different, they say y'all a lot, whereas in Mexico, they don't. They use a more formal. So it's not really y'all, but I'm just giving you that oh, as okay, an example. Okay. It's like, oh, a bunch of cowboys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, I mean, it's just, and, and since you've learned it, has it been a priority to keep that? Like, do you use it often? We go to Mexico every year. Okay. Um, and so usually we're there for two weeks and after like a day or two, I'm pretty comfortable and I'm back into it. The first so day cool. or so I, I say to people, oh, I haven't practiced. And then you get to a point where you're just put on the spot and somebody's, you know, my husband or one of the kids is asking for something and the person doesn't understand and I have to just jump in. And then it's like, oh yeah, it's back. <laughs> <That's> so <laughs> funny. <laughs> um, no, I think that, again, that's like, 
if you had to pick a couple of things, like I'd love to learn a language. I think Spanish makes more sense now just because of you know, like the way the U.S. is versus sure. like learning um, French. But it's still like there's a lot of language I think would be cool. Like I think it would be great to speak Italian or great to speak yeah. Spanish or you know oh, some know. of those um, – nicer languages mm-hmm. sounding languages like germans are like harsh and right. you know some of right. these uh um, or or like chinese it'd be cool to learn how to speak chinese yeah. oh i know that would be very cool i always say that to david i'm like i would love to learn chinese or really anything that's just way out there that seems really hard yeah because yeah. obviously like people understand it. a lot of people understand it. billions of people understand right. it. um i think they said that i've looked the closest language to english it's not obviously not english is uh norwegian Oh, really? They have a lot of the same words and a lot of the same spelling. So they like it's probably the easiest to jump back and oh, forth cool. between. Um, yeah. So, you know, hey, yeah. if you ever travel to Norway, <laughs> it might be fine. Um, so you say Italian. Italian's beautiful, except when your Italian great-grandmother is yelling at you to drink the milk that she just got from the cows in the barn, and you don't want to drink it. So are you Italian? <laughs> my mother, yeah, on my mom's side, we're, they're very Italian. Um, have you been to Italy? No. I'd love to. My mom's I, been a bunch, but I need to go. Um, I went once in high school, and it was, it's cool. It's Amazing. A, it's, yeah, it's just, I mean, I don't know Italian, but the food was great, and it's just, it was a cool, it was in April, so we kind of went from, like, the north down to the south, and we get to the south, it was, like, 90 degrees, and, yeah. um, it, but we went to, like, Capri, and, like, uh, you think, like, Naples, and Sorrento, and they're all kind of down that southern area, and it was, it was neat, like, just, I, I like experiencing different countries and stuff. It's Me been too. A, it's been a while since I've gone, but... Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, like I said, full circle, I'll go back to some other places. Yeah. Um, so once you get you know done, I'm going to jump past that. So now <laughs> we get past, you come back, you, you decide on Spanish. Yep. And then you do Spanish, you get your degree. Mm-hmm. Are you, you're completely fluent by the time you graduate, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Um, and then do you move back here? Or do you go elsewhere? Oh, gosh. So I immediately moved right back to Plattsburgh because, you know, living with mom and dad, it was free for yep. about a month until I decided this is not going to work. <laughs> um, but a good friend of mine was here going to graduate school. So we got an apartment together and I substitute taught in the Plattsburgh school district. I worked at the Comfort Inn and Court Club because that's what I had done all through college. And okay. I said, OK, now I'm going to apply to jobs and figure out what on earth am I going to do? And I was applying everywhere outside of Plattsburgh. I was driving down to Albany for interviews, and I was going out to Syracuse and Rochester and ultimately landed a job in Rochester and moved there. And uh, and that, you know, that was a a fresh start to something that led me kind of here, there, and everywhere. (laughs) Um, Again, I, I... Folks, I wish everybody could see the notes here because I'm like, which is great that there's like a million things I want to ask you. I'm just trying to like jump through some of these. So you, when did you backpack in Spain? Okay. So am I jumping too far ahead here? Well, it depends. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so you fill, know? Fill, fill in the-, the, the quick bullets are Rochester. I had a job that the company I was working for was opening an office in San Diego said, okay. Hey, would you want to go out and help out in the San Diego office close to Mexico? You could probably use your Spanish. We could use your help there. And I jumped on that opportunity. Okay. They moved me out to San Diego, lived out there for a bit, missed home. Um, My brother was working at a boarding school in Massachusetts, and he said, hey, they need a Spanish teacher. You should come. And he'd been saying that for like two years. And finally, I was homesick just enough that I said, let me go just entertain it. So they flew me to Massachusetts, got to see my family, go out to dinner. They, They gave me the rolled out the red carpet. I love the school. Took the job, moved back, and um, and from there, because that was a job teaching Spanish, my first time really teaching Spanish, and uh, they said, well, we do um, grants for people to take trips, and if you want to go to Spain or someplace to brush up on your Spanish, you know, just write out this application and we'll send you. So they sent me to Spain. I backpacked Spain for that whole summer, and... Um, and that's how I got to Spain. <laughs> so when you say back, so I always wonder this, like backpack Spain is like legit one backpack. You travel around, you stay in like hostels. You yes. just kind of like, are you working at all during that time? Or is that, because no. I'm assuming it's pretty cheap relative to here. Yeah. The grant gave me, um, the school that I was working for gave me money to get my ticket, mm-hmm. to get, uh, to pay for my expenses and to really experience Everything I felt I needed to experience there in order to brush up on my Spanish and be able to come back and teach better, you know, teach more to the kids. Like now I had an experience in Spain and I could teach them 
about Barcelona and about Madrid and about, you know, different artists and different churches and things that I was able to see while I was there. Um, so and when you're talking about, like, what, what's a, like, vagabonding in Spain, <laughs> like, when you're backpacking, like, what's that look like in... in like, I have a buddy right now. He's been on the podcast a couple of times. He's traveling all over the world. Like, he started in COVID, got to – he spent a lot of time in Buenos Aires. And yeah. probably pronounced that wrong, but that's fine. I'm sorry. Everybody knows where it is. <laughs> um, and ended up, like, getting caught kind of at the start of COVID and had to come back. Oh, and then yeah. he kind of delayed his trip. And now he's back. And I think – now he's, like, Eastern Asia right now. So oh, I wow. see him. And he's, like, been in Thailand cool. and Malaysia and, like, all these cool places Neat. and Vietnam. Um and he's just kind of like, same thing, jumping around. He's with all these different people. Mm-hmm. And he's early 30s, you know, single guy, just kind of, I mean, really living it up. Um, now, when you talk about like the backpacking aspect of it, like what, what's what's this actually look like in theory? Like when you're actually <laughs> going for 10 months, like yeah. where do you stay? How do you travel? Do you, you know, how do you make money or eat and do all the extras? How do you meet people? Yeah. I mean, I was fortunate. Um, the way I did it was I got a standby ticket out of New York City. And it was cheaper that way. Mm-hmm. It was at the time, it was like maybe $200. And, but you had to be willing. I was willing to go to Europe. I went to New York City and I said, I just want to get to Europe. I will figure it out from there. Okay. Um, I, ahead of time, I was able to buy a Euro pass so I could hop on the train in any part of Europe and get to Spain. Okay. So I was in the airport in New York City for, I think, a couple of days. My, my brother had dropped me off there and I had my backpack and you know, I had a calling card. It was before cell phones. Oh, so you weren't and, even like, yeah, you just like stayed in until they had an opening. I was just waiting for them to call my name. Yep, that they had a standby. And you were there how flight. many days? I think I, I think I might have been there like a day and a half to two days before I got a flight. <laughs> do, do you have, is there like and, a place to shower and change and sleep? And I think I was just hanging just out. Young, like young just and young and care. maybe right. dumb. I don't All know. All right. That's, I was going to say dumb, but there you go. Yeah, young and dumb, just doing it. Okay. <laughs> And, um, but I met a girl who was doing the same thing and she, we kind of eyeballed each other like, Hey, I think this person might be doing what I'm doing. And then at one point, um, they called like standby passengers. I don't even think it was by name. It was standby passengers to go to this, this desk. And she and I both went and they had tickets to, um, Madrid. And so, and they had two tickets. And so she and I kind of looked at each other like, well, do you want to go together and maybe stay the first night somewhere together. And, and I discovered she was going to Germany. I was going to Spain. So it worked out well. We would just stay in host- the hostel together that first night. Mm-hmm. But we had so much fun together. We hit it off that she decided to stay with me the whole time. And then She never made the Germany. N- well, she did. After, oh. after when we decided to part and I decided to come home, um, I think I was running low on money and getting homesick. Yeah. Um, she went to Germany then. So, and I'm still friends with her today too. So if you, so when you fly into Madrid and like, like hostels, how does the hostel situation work? I mean, is that, I mean. I mean, it has to be different today with the internet and um, is cell there phones. Like a network of them? But yeah, we had, I've, I've forgotten the name of the book. I think it still exists today, but there was a book that had different phone numbers and names of hostels that accepted individuals you know you could walk in or call last minute and so we would just call places but i spoke spanish and she didn't so we were going to pay phones and i was calling all these hostels to see if they had two beds for us to stay in and yeah i don't know today i imagine it's way easier today well it's tough to <laughs> put hostel book and i think they're like booking a hostel like, yeah. no, 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 like physical Is book. It like um maybe Fod- book book, book. <laughs> like one of the travel books is it like fodders or something like that i don't know i'm probably saying that wrong too i really don't remember but it was like she had the book and i had the book and we both had marked like different places and so we were just ca- we would just call down them and we would look at neighborhoods that we thought we wanted to stay in and we would look for hostels in that neighborhood and then if we wanted to do a trip and like leave well we did leave we left madrid and we went to all different little towns. We went to, we did the running of the bulls in Pamplona. Did you slap a bull? Yeah. We, <laughs> you know what? We saw so many people with like bandages and bloodied and they wore them like, like tattoos. Like people were so proud of that. Like, like how close are you to a bull? Oh yeah, right there. Oh, you are? Oh yeah. I just yeah. figured there's like a bunch of people. I'm like, ah, the bull's over there. And I'm like with the group. <laughs> yeah, you can, there's crowds certainly, but you can work your way right to the 
fences or right in some areas where the streets wind and turn you can get down the little alleys and watch the bulls run by you can be right there oh but you weren't like physically like inside I, the gate i running. did not run with them okay. no i was I'm say, too I clumsy you. i, I would have just like watched been like yeah those people are I, crazy but i would not be here today uh, probably <laughs> you would have trampled one, yes. one of the yeah. unsuccessful stories <laughs> um so sorry back to the hostels so you and, and hostels are can you describe i kind of know but you'll describe it better than me so I think there's all sorts of different ones. Um, we were specifically looking for ones that would have like a bedroom that we could stay in and lock our door. Um, there are some that, you know, there's shared bedrooms and shared hallways and things. But we were looking for ones that had bedrooms where we could have our our own place to sleep. We never left stuff there. We didn't trust that. But we would usually have a shared bathroom. Like at the end of the hall, there'd be a bathroom and mm-hmm. with a lock on it. So and, and physically with you was just a backpack. Yep. So again, you got better from the suitcase, you know, Mexico suitcase. Yes, event. So, um, <laughs> learned from that. So like regarding like showering or like washing clothes and like all the hostels had stuff for this? Um, we would go to laundromats or go okay. to the showers. Yes, the hostels, the bathroom, would you, we would stay at ones that had a shower and okay. place to get cleaned up. So you wear sh- shower sandals? Uh, I do now. I don't know okay. if I did then. I, Again, I hope I did. Young and dumb, just doing your thing. <laughs> right. um, so when you travel around, like, you know, um, bouncing from place to place, are you traveling mostly by bus or are you traveling Everything. by train? Train, bus, train, plane, metro, automobile. yeah, whatever. We took, we did take flights occasionally if that was the cheaper and faster way to go. And and the, and the flights, I mean, Europe, flight, especially in Spain, that's going to be pretty much like an up-down trip. It's yeah. pretty easy. Yep. Pretty much we stayed on the, the Eurail. I think it was called a URL pass and it was the year I don't I don't remember exactly but the train that you can just take everywhere in Europe so what's a normal so you're there 10 months you said no just a, um like two months oh two months mm-hmm. so what what's like a normal day like you said you're not working right right so nope. you just kind of like wake up and you're like what do we explore today <laughs> so really it's like well, a- my job was to be able to come back to the school and write up a, a you know a summary of everything I did for the grant money that I did take mm-hmm. So I did have to have like the job was to make sure that I was learning something and seeing something and able to show what I did with this money. No AI to type in like, tell me a two months. (laughs) Right. Draft this up for me. Yeah, no, I had to write a full report on everything I did. So, but like every day, did you just like wake up and say, let's just go to that museum or let's just go to this park or let's go to this pretty much? Yeah, we had that same travel book had like cool stuff to see and do and places to go. And so sometimes we'd take a day trip outside of whatever city we were staying in or other times we would just go someplace new and stay wherever we found to stay. And And I'm sure like evenings was like a meal or getting drinks places and just kind of hanging out with like local people. Yes, absolutely. Um, (laughs) I feel like that like level... I've never done that, but that level of like freedom sounds awesome. Where you just wake up and just do like I can do whatever today I, know, I want. I know. I don't think there's any chance that I uh, appreciated it even remotely close to the way I would now. Yeah. Oh, I you agree. Know? Yeah. <laughs> At the time, I was just it just it was the life I was living. Now I look back and I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't even believe I did that. First of all, I can't believe my parents let me. Well, know? I was thinking of that too, but like, just, I mean wasn't that long ago but it's like a different time oh totally you know a couple decades it's like oh yeah now people are like no 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 no. like right. I got a GP, i'm tr- like tracking you where you're exactly. Going. exactly um so and when you go like backpack and, and jump around like how much does it because again you're not working how much does it cost to keep up like a two-month excursion back then oh my gosh i like, don't on, I, a couple grand maybe? i think the total grant that i had might have been five thousand dollars and that was more than for the most part oh yeah okay yeah um yeah, it just that sounds so much fun. Like, <laughs> so you also wrote, and I'm not going to let you not talk about this. You beat up <laughs> a guy in the subway for your dad's passport. <laughs> well, yeah, kind of. Um, so my dad, <laughs> so we had internet cafes, right? And every couple days I would pop into an internet cafe to see if I got an email because, I mean, we didn't have the Simple phones. Simple times. And, oh, it was well, crazy. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great to check your email only like oh my every gosh, three, four days? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Imagine have, that. And I have hundreds, have like three. I'm like, oh, easy. <laughs> right. I'm actually looking forward to seeing oh, what I have. Oh, I can't go a weekend without like every hour clearing out my email because it would just be forever lost. I got, I got right? something great for you I'll talk to you after about okay. with email. You'll like this. Perfect. Um, So my dad sent an email saying, I think I'm going to meet up with you. And I can get a flight into Barcelona, and he gave me the date. So, um, you know, great, wonderful. That's that's perfect. I'll get myself to Barcelona. I think I was maybe in Madrid or Valencia or someplace when I got the email. 
And um, and so I, I got to Barcelona, met my dad. He's on, we're on the metro and I've got my big backpack. And my backpack, you know, at the time, I was just a tiny thing. I mean, I don't know if I weighed 110 pounds. I probably, I'm sure I didn't, like 105 maybe. But my backpack also probably weighed 70, 80 pounds. <laughs> So I have my big backpack on, my dad's got his bag, and uh, and we're on the metro. And so when I first got to Spain, the girl that I was traveling with from New York City had been talking to people, and they said, watch out for pickpocketers. It's a big deal in Spain. You're going to get pickpocketed. If you have any anything that makes you vulnerable, forget it. So we were wearing our passports under our shirts against our skin, and we were really careful with all that stuff. My backpack had nothing of value in it, really. Mm-hmm. So my dad gets there. We're straight from the airport. We're on the metro. And, um, oh, I jumped over the story. So so the girl had told me that people were telling her that the pickpocketers, one of the things they would do is they would drop, like, keys on the ground and bend over to pick them up so that you're walking. And, you know, naturally, you either help them pick them up or you walk around them so you don't step on them. Well, when you're doing that, someone else is pickpocketing you. Mm-hmm. So... I'm on the metro with my dad. I hadn't seen this yet while I had been there for maybe five weeks. And I get pushed, full on pushed off the train at the stop. Like the doors open. We're not getting off at that stop. And suddenly I'm pushed off. And I, um, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, I turn around because I'm, you know, you get pushed and you're like, what is going on? And I see my dad and he's yelling, Elizabeth hold on, Elizabeth, and we're, we're going to maybe make plans for getting off at the next stop if he doesn't make it, you know. And I see in front of him someone bending over to pick up something, and it just clicks. I'm like, wait, 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 somebody's robbing him right now. And I look, and sure enough, I see this guy's hand pulling my dad's passport away from him. Wow. And it was like in my dad's pocket or something, and I guess I hadn't thought to tell him, or I just thought maybe my dad knew to keep his stuff covered. And, uh, and I didn't even think. I mean, I literally just jumped on the guy (laughs) I just lunged at him to the point of I think I had his skin under my fingernails and I know it makes me sound like an insane person (laughs) (laughs) um, and I got his passport everything that he had in his hands including the passport fell to the ground and the guy started yelling at me and screaming and swearing in Spanish and my dad's like what's going on and he works his way off the train and he's looking like thinking I'm getting in a you know an altercation with somebody that I'm getting attacked and then I pick up all his stuff and I hand it to him. I'm like, this guy was stealing this from you. And my dad's just looking at me like, what just happened? You know, I can't even believe that we're in this situation. And so the guy starts, he's running, running away, screaming at me and disappears around the corner. And I swear, like, just like in New York City, when the train leaves, like seconds later, you could just hear a pin drop. Yeah. Like, the that. hustle and bustle is just gone. We're standing there. I think my dad and I didn't talk to each other for like two hours. <laughs> really? Because I was just in shock. I mean, it was just one of those insane things. I look back at it all the time. I'm like, that was really dumb. <laughs> was he's really he's dumb. probably like, you left for like three weeks and now you're like, <laughs> yeah, you're like full on Navy SEAL on this guy. Um, <laughs> but, wow. So obviously he got his passport back. It's weird that they it? steal passports. I know. Well, I, I think he was just reaching to take anything he could. Yeah, there might have been a credit a card and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, like, I'm looking at Spain right now, and I, I don't have a lot of... I mean, I know where Spain is on a map, mm-hmm. but, like, I didn't know Barcelona was that northeast in Spain. And then, obviously, like, the Strait of Gibraltar and Seville, I've heard that. I've heard of Valencia. Yes, I didn't get to... I've heard of Ibiza. I didn't even know that was a, know. an island. Um, <laughs> I didn't get to Ibiza, which they say Ibiza, because the Z is a TH, what I was Ibiza? saying earlier. Yeah, and um, I didn't get to Seville or Sevilla. Valencia? Um, I did go to Valencia, and I did go to um, Toledo, and um, Pamplona, of course, Madrid, Barcelona. Where, where's Pamplona? That's the Bulls, um, right? Yes. Um, zoom in a little bit more. Where's it near? Um, good question. Pamplona. Gosh, I've forgotten my Spain geography. But I didn't go south, so it's it's up in this area. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Might have to take. Is it, it more in. like Barcelona? Um, no, it's not on the water. Pamplona. Wow, it's way up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Wow, that's weird that it's. Wow, it's very north. Yep. So, what was the running of the bulls like? Why is that a thing? Um. Do you know the history of it? At the time, I did, I probably did, but I've I've since forgotten. 
um, but it's might like be able a, to pull it out. But it's like a street, right? It's not like they're. It's not like a course. That they... Yeah, it's a little town. You're just. It's the streets of the town are set up so that your the bulls are released and they're running through the streets, and then they end in the um, stadium in the bull ring, and there's a bullfight that follows. Is this one day a year? It. I believe it was seven days. It's every day. Also yeah. like a, almost like a festival. It's like a bowl yeah, festival. Yeah, it's, just... it's a full festival. And wow. nobody sleeps. Like it was just, we were so exhausted after being in Pamplona. <laughs> um, wow. I think we spent three days there and we were just ready to get back to anywhere that wasn't Pamplona after that. Is it just a big party for four, five, or a week? Yeah. Yeah. Food I, and drinks and I party didn't... and people yelling and celebrating anybody who's wounded. <laughs> yeah. Well, pack, did you just like... Throw some ketchup on yourself and like put <laughs> yeah. a bandage on. Like, yeah, I'm one of them. Right. Um, <laughs> um, so you come back from Spain um, and you end up going where? So now we're still teaching. Yes, I was teaching in, in Massachusetts and really missed California, believe it or not. But I really would like to get back to where I once in a while get to use Spanish just because I'm in the grocery store or... Yeah. You know, I get to go down to Mexico. My friends and I in San Diego would go down to Mexico just for a weekend. Like Tijuana? We'd go a little further than Tijuana, but okay. yeah. Is Tijuana is like very touristy because it's right there, like on the edge of the border? Yeah, and there's some scary parts to the city that you wouldn't necessarily want to hang out in. So we would just go south and get to the, just go to like the little beach towns. How, how like, I mean, I, I always hear, like if you were to ask me like, is Mexico like a safe place? I'd be like, it's probably like not. Like, I mean, you hear, like, the cartels and you hear all this crazy stuff. But that's, like, very small areas, right? It's not, like, all over. You know what? It's really funny because um, when I lived there, I saw none of it. I saw. I would say it's it was so safe. I never felt anything. But David and I watched Narcos. Do you, have you ever watched Narcos? No, but I watched uh, Ozark. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking so, Bad, like, all that. Like. <laughs> right, right. So narcos is like they're telling the stories of these drug cartels their their true stories are based on true events and they all of the most of these things that are happening were right where i was living like right outside of where i was living or right in areas that i was in certainly mexico city and i never saw any of it so again i don't know if i was young and dumb or if i just was sheltered or just safe i don't know but it it is kind of a little bit of everywhere i mean i think you can find it Almost everywhere. Um, I was going to say, because I, I mean, I'm looking at like, I, I don't know, you, you see stuff and then you think it's bad. But it's also, I feel like, you know, people, if they generalize like New York, like, oh, New Yorkers. Exactly. I'm like, well, I, like, yeah, New York City, which is five hours away, which is its own beast. And right. really, when you go to New York City, like, you know, so many just like families are just walking around. It's exactly. Not like you're, yeah, you're seeing bad things. I mean, you might yeah. see some stuff, but it's a city. Like, right. You There's know, parts Southern of the city. That, more, more. Exactly. There's parts of the city you might avoid at a certain time of night and you might not go to in the middle of the night by yourself. Yeah. Um, and then there's other parts of the city that you probably wouldn't see anything ever. And that's the same thing in Mexico. I mean, can't, I've spent a lot of time in Cancun and you hear things or see things on the news and, oh, this is happening. But for the most part, those things are happening in downtown Cancun and not right where we would go if we were there. And, and news has a, um, a habit of, uh, what's it called, embellishing things. Yes. Like you know, <laughs> they make a little like anthill into a big mountain type yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, so California, because there's a lot of stuff I want to get here. So <laughs> we got California. We move back. Spanish teacher, a sable. From, let me see, from there, real estate. Um, how long were you? Three years in real estate? So you, oh, you came in did like... Did I say three years? I don't know. Four years? Was... You, you were... Yeah, so you were in about a year before I joined. So I, I literally just yeah. missed you. Well, I didn't do... I, I had my real estate license, but I was working as a property manager for Whitbeck. Gotcha. Okay. So, so you weren't doing any like sales things. It was just more of like the managing right. of the properties. Yep. Gotcha. But I had to have a license in order to do, to do that. So. Yep. Mm-hmm. Fun test. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Watching paint dry, but it's fun. Yep. Continuing ed is even better. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So I didn't know that. That's cool. So real estate, Tory travel. Yep. And I then, would... and then I'm guessing based on the gap, was that kind of when the kids were born and yes. kind of do? Okay. So I stayed home um, with the kids. Lucas was is six years older than Reese, but um, but I was home with them for right up until we started Core Your Staffing. Um, 
Was that my wife actually liked the name? It's R Y or R H Y S, right? Yep. That was uh, we like one syllable boy name, so mm-hmm. we have we have Crew and Pen. Oh, cool. So we had like for the boys we wanted, but Reese was like one of our oh, I, before was it? I knew your son was named yeah. Reese. So, but she really liked that name. Yeah, it's like a like Welsh almost. It's Welsh. Right? Yeah. Yep. Um. So was it was it hard? I mean, you did a whole a whole lot in. Uh, was it hard for you to step away from work to be a mom? Oh my gosh! Was it natural, or were you like itching to really get back into oh, like, it was workforce? So it was so hard, um, but also it was hard because it was a hard job. It was probably the hardest job I've ever had. Oh, was being home. Yeah. Oh, I, I being I, home with the kids alone. Um, mm-hmm. Just it just was really hard, especially when Reese was a baby, and Lucas was going to school, and I was you know juggling all of that. It was it was really really hard. I loved working and missed working and was super excited when it was time to get back to work. But I also um, I just found being a stay at home mom very difficult. I give a lot of credit I, to anybody who does it. <laughs> I, I, I've said that I think the hardest job on planet Earth is being a mom. Yeah. Like I said, I'll say it, dads are tough, but moms like there's oh, yeah. moms can't be replaced. Like I, I don't. <laughs> and I think even like when I was a kid, or even like when you're an adult, like moms are just different than dads. Like yeah. you just have a different connection, and I don't know if it's nine months in the womb kind of thing, but you, uh, yeah, I mean it's just like it's hard to replace a mom. So, uh, but again, go leaving. Um, you know, and I have this conversation with my wife a lot. And she's, you know, my, and my wife definitely comes more from the perspective. Of, I mean, jobs for sure, but more from like sports. Mm-hmm. So like her thing with sports too is that, you know, she was an athlete. And you see, you know, like case in point, you take someone like Serena Williams that has a kid and then comes back and like physically is different and doesn't have as much, you know, time to spend practicing. And then you see like in most guys in sports don't. They have kids like now you have extra, you know, you do have extra responsibilities, but physically you you can still kind of do the same thing. Your body mm-hmm. doesn't change. And so my wife's always been under that thing of like, hey, or like Alex Morgan coming back and scoring goals for, you know, the women's soccer team with a kid, which is right. awesome. So I always send her stuff <laughs> like that. She, she, of course, she gets, she's very competitive with is sports, she? but then she's like, you know, <laughs> we start talking about like females in sports. She loves it because yeah. of, you know, the ones that have kids, but, um, That's great. but for, yeah, so that was a, a hard transition, like out of the workforce. And then, did you have to wait? You were what did I say before that? Tori traveled. Did you did you have to like reinvent kind of like the business persona of yourself? Because you were gone for about five years, six years. Yeah, something like, like that. Like getting back into like the workforce and kind of like building back up your connections, or do you feel that you had enough? Like, yeah, just you... mutual with people and. I definitely had to build back up um, mostly my confidence. I think I might still be affected by it. I told you I get so nervous to talk and speak in public. I never was like that before. Is it so, like imposter syndrome or do you think that it's more maybe. just lack of confidence? Uh, good question. I really don't know. I okay. mean, it's just different than I was. I feel like before having kids and before taking the time away, I was just in go mode. I was always, I was never afraid of anything. I just would try things and never really mattered to me if I failed. It was like, that's a learning opportunity. We'll just keep going forward. Maybe I have more on the line now. I mean, maybe it's just different. It's not getting back to work, but it's getting back to work for us, mm-hmm. for ourselves, for our family. There's a lot uh, based on us being successful. You can't just hop on the metro and go to the next city. <laughs> yeah, right. If it doesn't work out, I can't just pick up and leave. Yeah, well, I think that's, yeah, it does like, uh, what, what, I don't I think it's a proper term. I've heard the term golden handcuffs. I don't know if that's the actual term that this is referring to, but the idea of like, you build up success, but with that, it, there's um, like I, I even thought of like this: like there's certain things I can't just. I would love to do, but it's like it's it's hard, way easier said than done because mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, I could do that or do that, but it's like there's a lot, there's a lot more complexity of things in place because you have to your spouse or your kids that you have to then think about them too, where it's like, okay, I'm going to suck it up and do this or that because of them, not necessarily because it's something I really want to. Yeah. So there's, I mean, you sacrifice for, again, the ones you love, but obviously in your family, you have, I'm not, I'll take your dogs out of this equation here. You have three (laughs) people in your family that are like, that's my core group, you know? Exactly. Um, So, and I, and I guess starting getting back in and starting, you know, getting back in the workforce, getting into a, a business with your husband, starting a business from scratch. How was that first year kind of, again, drinking from like, what do they call it? Drinking from like a fire hose kind of thing? Like, was <laughs> yeah. it just like seat of your pants, kind of figure it out as you go? Entirely. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
yeah, we just, I mean, we had, we knew some things. We knew a lot, mm -hmm. but we had never done it. And so it was time to take everything that we knew and just make something of it. You know, we knew that we needed to find an accountant right away. Mm -hmm. We talked to Doug Hoffman. We were fortunate enough that he actually opened his door to us and listened to us <laughs> and decided to take a chance on us. Um, we knew we needed an attorney. We needed a business plan. We needed a bank. You know, we put all of that in motion from pretty much day one. I mean, within a couple of weeks of us deciding to do this, we had all of that in place. And then from there, it was, all right, next steps, you know, insurance and having a place to call home and uh, a what, name. Was your first location <laughs> in the Whitbeck building yes. on Miller? Okay. And yep. so you've only had the two in the history of... Yeah. Of, of, of course, you're staffing. Yeah. yeah. So when... Because I've heard this before, like when... And if you don't mind me asking, what age were you, you and David both around at this time? Oh, goodness. I guess I was probably... Um, well, I could do the math. It was seven years ago. I'm 48, so I was 41. 40. And, and David about the same age? <laughs> um, no, David is, well, depending on what time of year, he's seven years older than me or six years. Is he? Yeah. Wow. Yep. <laughs> you, I would not have, David, I know, you look he looks great. great right? You look great. I would not have guessed that. I was like, you're 47, 48. So. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, good job, David. Um, the, uh, so, but, but to, I mean, to like reinvent a little bit, I mean, obviously, he had some experience in the past, but like really to reinvent something at, you know, at that age, um, which I think most people, I heard this line today. It's like most people don't quit enough, meaning you don't quit something you don't like, or you don't quit mm. something that you're involved in that you really should, if they're not like loving it, like pivot yeah. and do something different. Um, but again, restarting. So you take like being in your forties, like restarting a business. It's not like hitting the reset button as if you were 20 years old. It's like, you've had multiple decades of like a professional life or an adult life at least to tap mm -hmm. into so it's like you're resetting but with all that knowledge still staying with you right um so that you guys obviously uh, you felt that you said right because mm -hmm. from day one it's like like 20 yeah. you're like we i don't know like i <laughs> right. guess i need we a name nothing. and then like we actually need a legal name like you need yeah. <laughs> so yeah uh, um and how, how did the business start? Was it just you and David? Did you have anybody on staff or any, you know, recruiters or however that works? No, it really started with just the two of us sitting on our living room couch, deciding that I think we're going to do this mm -hmm. and um, driving around. You know, we went to Lake Placid to talk to Doug Hoffman. We found an attorney referred by Doug Hoffman, who was also in Lake Placid, um, drove out to Potsdam to talk to a company that we thought maybe we would be interested in acquiring instead of starting from scratch, but um, decided against that too. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, it started with just the two of us. And to be honest, I don't even remember how we we ended up talking with um, Peter and PJ Whitbeck, but Peter Whitbeck said that someone in his life had done him a, a favor yeah. and that he was paying it forward. And all he asked for us was to do the same someday. And he opened his doors to us. He had an office space that was available and he said, I won't charge you rent until you can afford it. So get oh, in wow. here, get set up, and uh, you let me know when you can afford it. So that's old Peter. That's old Peter. Fa yeah, yeah. Um, he's not old. Not but... PJ, but yes, <laughs> yeah. older Peter. Yeah. Um, oh, that's very cool of him. I yeah. know. Um, so, and was there any other, um, like recruiting? But was there any other possible things that you would have gone into, or was recruiting really like the the one that stuck out the most? Well, I will say that. Um, I mean, recruiting seemed like that was it. That was going to be the path. However, when we're sitting on our couch, one of the things David said is he'd always wanted to work with high school students. He just knew he always wanted to work with high school students. He'd never worked anywhere that that was supported. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, whatever we do, however we go about doing this, we've got to start working with high school students because he was pretty passionate about it. So the first thing we did before we even had the office space or anything else was we um, signed up to do a career fair, if you will, in, at Chattagay Schools. And it, we, we uh, signed up to have a table to meet all the students and the seniors who were graduating on this you know, random day in the spring. And uh, we didn't have a logo or a name or anything yet. I mean, I think we did have the name because we might have been incorporated, but we hadn't designed what it was going to look like. Yeah. And we found a designer um, online who was uh, through, I think it was called Upwork. There's a, oh, yeah. there's, yep. yeah. Yep. And he created, we told him what we were doing, what we wanted to do. And he created our logo that we have today. 
and um, the little ties. Yeah, because yep. <laughs> it's if you look at it, it's a search um, magnifying glass. It's a bolt for. Um, oh, I'm, here I got, I got a little cheat sheet. You got to look at it. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it, but I'm like. <laughs> so there's a magnifying glass for the search. There's a bolt for the industrial. Oh. It all comes into a tie for professional, and there's a paper clip in there for administrative. See it all? <laughs> Where's the? The paper clip, the tie kind of wraps around like a like it would be a paper clip. Oh, got, oh, yep, the tail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew that. That's yeah. really cool. So we, um, huh. so we had that. We had the, the logo and the name, you know, Courier Staffing just written. We decided our color and we said, okay, now we need business cards and a little sign. So he called, I think, Mike Carpenter or Betsy Vicencio, one of them, and said, yeah. can you help us out? They said, what the heck are you up to, Courier? <laughs> you know, Mike was the um, last podcast. Yes. <laughs> oh, he was. He was. That's yep, perfect. Last week. Um, he's great. So they printed it for us. They printed us this little sign and these little business cards, kind of not knowing. I don't think. I mean, maybe we we had that by that point had given them a clue as to what was going on. But we went out to Chateaugay. We um, set up a table. We stopped at the dollar store on our way out and bought a blue tablecloth and and a little holder for our sign. And we put it on the table with a bowl of candy and. Handed out business cards to students. And you guys have said, come a long way. So. Yeah. <laughs> we said, this is what we're doing. So our very first thing that we did as courier staffing anywhere in the area, whatever in our lives, was that high school job fair. I'm yeah. always fascinated by people that, like the origin stories of businesses, because mm-hmm. I think that most people don't see it. They see it a couple years down the road. and like, well, how did you start everybody that I've ever talked to has this very basic story. Like, <laughs> yeah. this is what I did. I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah. that's all I did. And yeah. like, like I always go back to like Shoe Dog, which is the the, the book about uh, Phil Knight and Nike. Mm. Like he used to sell like Japanese shoes out of the back of his car at track meets. Oh, wow. And like back in the 70s. And yeah. like he was just pedaling shoes in the back. Right. Like, who's this guy? I don't so know. Cool. But now he's the founder, the founder <laughs> of Nike. Um, so you guys like dive into it. At what... Um, like the first year, like at what point did you feel like you had some traction that you were like, okay, this this is actually more than just like a like a, an idea? I mean, it pretty much was right off the bat. We didn't really let the public know until the Business Expo that year. It was okay. June 2nd, I think. And when did you start officially? Um, our, well, our, we were incorporated on March 20th. Okay. And we got our insurances on May 9th that year. So we, we had all the, you know, everything was okay. in the works, but it became official then. Okay. Um, so by then we had our bank account, we had everything all in place. And then Business Expo was June 2nd. And so the the business community accepted us pretty much right away. Thankfully, mm-hmm. David had a wonderful reputation and okay. uh, he had great connections. So I think people saw Courier on the door and said, We know hey, that guy. Yeah, we know that guy. Um I was going to say, this might be a, a quite, I mean, it, it, probably for both of you, I was going to say, it, David, obviously, kind of being in the field before, but how how much do you feel, like, in a small town like that, that the name matters, like, the, the like it's uh, it's kind of, like, if you take an idea, but it's like betting on the horse kind of person, like, you bet on the jock, or the jockey, the horse, whatever you want to call it, you bet on someone that you know, even though the race has to be run, you're like, that person's got a track record, and we at least know a little bit of what we're getting. Right. So that definitely helped you out having, oh yeah, like it wasn't like you were two no names coming in or like, who are those people? Right, right. No, um, I think that, you know, everybody that David had worked with in the past who reached out to us, because we didn't make any outbound calls for, I mean, we still kind of aren't, you know. Yeah, good position. Yeah. yeah. And, um, And I mean, we have a lot of marketing for finding candidates. And I think people see that and maybe companies, of course, we want them to see that too. But um, but a lot of it has been people knew David and people still know David. And when they're either looking for work or they're looking for employees, they call Courier. Good, good people, great jobs. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, you so, know the slogan. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because that, that was something that came about on our couch, just the two of us. I had a lined piece of paper and I wrote about 50 different slogans and we crossed a bunch out. And then we narrowed it down to two. And one of them was um, helping good people find great jobs. And so we ran with that for maybe the first like six months to a year. Did you know Meg Lefave? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Meg is just. She's you know, great. She's so wonderful. Yep. So she was working with us and she was the one who said, we really need to shorten this. And so yeah. she said, let's just do good people, great jobs. Yeah. Get rid of all your other words in here. But so you'll see sometimes something that still says helping good people find great jobs. Um, 
No, I was going to say, uh, the last year, year and a half, I've been really um, focusing on like less is more, like simplifying stuff. And that's like a perfect example. It's mm-hmm. like take out, take out more words, or take out more words, go to less, and now it makes, it's more powerful. Like yeah. It, it hits better. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Again, back to the notes here. Um, <laughs> I, I want to stay a little bit. You don't have to use all the notes. Huh? They just, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to hit some. I mean, I still have <laughs> a couple. All thing. night. We got the motorcycle lace. I'm not going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I want to, no. I want to go through, I want to go through some more of the work stuff and then we'll maybe transition over to some of the other fun stuff. Um, ben and J- you worked at Ben and Jerry's? Well. BK? <laughs> I worked, Ben and Jerry's was just a funny, I was really young. I didn't have a job and my girlfriend did have a job, but she kept going on vacation and needed someone to cover for her. So a few times I covered for her and I'd ride my bike to the grocery stores um, and just park my bike out front, walk in, go right into the freezer section, grab a a dolly of um, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. I would put it in the freezers, take inventory, leave the inventory chart and Take Hop on my bike and, and drive away. <laughs> yeah, they always day. would say I could take an ice cream. Um, Chunky Monkey was my Chunky ice cream Monkey. Of... I like Chub. Uh, ch- no, wait, Chunky Monkey. That's the one. Banana. banana. Yeah. See, that's no. I like Chubby Hubby because it's got the <laughs> peanut butter and pretzels. Um, let me see. You met David through Stephen Bailey. Yes. You we'll know we'll dive into that later. I know Stephen. Yes, <laughs> Stephen's okay. great. Actually, tomorrow morning I go there. Oh no way! Um, without Stephen, I wish right, Stephen was still course. there. I always love talking to him. Um, let me see. Oh my God, Liz, there's so much what? here. What? what? No, no. I mean, there's like good <laughs> stuff, but I'm trying to go. I just want to make sure I'm not d- jumping over. Oh, man, listen, we could talk about none of it. We could talk. No, about no, all we're of talking. It. We're talking about all of it. Wow. Wait. Okay. No, sorry. Wait, coming back. <laughs> Some of these are really good. Oh, I'm okay. This we're gonna dive a lot more into that there. Uh-oh. Um, so one of the things that I I like that you wrote down, and I I want you to expand on it. Power of doing something versus talking or thinking about it. Yes. Can you expand on that more? Because <laughs> when you wrote that, I'm like that. I am definitely bringing that up. <laughs> well, I think um, in some ways, I, I by looking at all of this, I have lived my life this way, and fortunately, David does too. It's like there's there's just so much. Because he was that you a ski bum, do. right? Oh, he skied. He like, hiked. I, I say mean, ski bum. I use that term in, in like the the <laughs> yeah. the correct like s- ski bum. You know what I mean? Like he was living on a mountain for a bit, yeah. right? Yeah, he's done the skiing thing. He's climbed Mount Rainier. He's ran in two, I think, if not more, marathons. He's like, David just does it all. You know, he's done deep sea fishing in Alaska. And I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, even with courier staffing, it's like we could have sat around for months and weeks and, you know, time after time just talking about doing something. But instead we said, Nope, we're just going to do it. We got up the next day and we said, here's what we're doing today. And, you know, I say things like that at work all the time. Um, probably not so much now as as much as when we first started out because we have some more seasoned employees now. But people would come up with these great ideas or they would talk about things and I would say, just do it. Like it's the whole Nike slogan, right? Mm-hmm. Just do it. Just take it upon yourself, put it into action, make it happen and let's do it. We're a team. We can do it together. But why are we talking about it? Um, so I, I think that, cause like you hear like the term, like talk is cheap and all that stuff. Like, and I think ideas, there's, there's a difference. Um, like thinking is very hard when you do it properly, when you're like truly like deep thinking and really strategizing and stuff like that takes a lot of mental energy, mm-hmm. but you gotta, and, and like, I like reading books. So people are like, oh, you read books. I'm like, well, you can read books, but if you don't apply what you read, then mm-hmm. really it's, you can still read them for enjoyment. But I said, if it's really like applying what you, you learn from them or, or conversations, or if you hear something off of a podcast or, or if you go to like a conference for your, your, like, this is the one that bugs me the most. Like people will spend money, go to a three day conference. And yes, you, most of them like go out and have fun. But like if you, and you can have fun, but if you go out really with the idea that I'm going to pull some you know, things out of this that I'm going to go back and implement. Um, like that's the purpose of it. So mm-hmm. when, it, when it comes to like, I find like doing something or talking, think about it. This even comes down to like 
like if you're like, hey, I, Gail and I got, we should really do X, Y, and Z, or hey, we should really get together and have lunch. I'm like, okay, like let's do it next week. Like I, my, that's how my, I just re- like I'd rather do something now because it gets punted out. And I also think selfishly, like if we don't do it next week when I know I have some openings and we punt it out for three weeks, I might be like fully booked. Right. So that's that's also. In my mind, it's like, let's just get it on paper or let's get it on the calendar. Or like, let's just commit to do it and, and do it versus, you know, hey, this should happen. This should happen. This should happen. This should happen. Yeah. Um, like one of the things you're, you're – Dave is going to kill me on this. <laughs> I, I But again, I wish I could show him to – we've talked about doing like – this podcast idea that he had, which I thought was great. And David, I did not forget about this. So if you're listening, if not, Liz, you can clue him in on it. I still have it saved. But like to me, it's like a shiny object thing. Like I want to do it, but I got to put right. it on the shelf a little bit. But it's also one where I'm like, I st- like I have a lot of things that I'm like, I st- that's still like there. Yep. With a few other things, I'm like, that's still there, but I have to be, you know, kind of like that list of like, I have 50 things. Like which one's the big things I really have to put the time into now? Uh, but a lot of it is still the doing part of it. Like I find that... If I can do everything now, then a lot of the things I'm thinking about or want to do or, or maybe fun things that give me opportunity later on, mm-hmm. by doing stuff now, I'll be able to do those things in the, in the future and not just, they just sit there forever. Exactly. Yeah, some things you need to go through the process in, to, in order to be able to do them. And so it's not as easy to just say, okay, let's get up tomorrow and do that. Mm-hmm. But everything that you're doing today is leading you to get to be to that point where you are able to do that. So, you know, I think like, as far as business goes, I talked about the vision, I have a clear vision for where we're going. Mm -hmm. And David knows it, and we're both on the same page. But I know there's a lot that needs to happen before we can get there. And so yes, we are doing it. But we need to go through some steps before we can get there. And Do you have a timeline for that? Roughly? That's the hard part, because there's so many outside influences, there's so many obstacles that you run into that you don't anticipate. So we have a rough timeline. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, and I'm saying like, it could be like five years, but it might yep. take you four, might take you seven. Exactly. Like, but it's in that it's not yep. 15 years, like you have a kind of a right. general. Yep. Um, we have a five year plan that we hope is two years. <laughs> well, I, so I heard this thing. Um, and I, I like like, and this is through like reading stuff. But one of the th- things that came up was and I've said this before on the podcast. And I forgot who said it, I got it from Tim Ferriss, but it wasn't Tim Ferriss. He quoted from another person. He said, um, how can you accomplish your 10 year goal in six months? And the idea behind it was like, you say that anybody that's got like vision, like your, your head probably went like, Oh, okay. Like what would I do? Like right. you really focus on the bit, like you could probably pick a couple things off the cuff that like, I would just focus on this or I would have to make these adjustments in order for that to even happen. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is very aggressive. Like right. it's not, it's not stuff that's like, Oh, that I'll just like, yeah, I'll just do that tomorrow. It's like, oh, yeah. no, you got to like revamp the whole, like a lot of stuff to yeah. make it happen. But I find the idea of most goals, and again, this is like a cliche thing, but most people overestimate what they can do in a year, but underestimate what they can do in 10. Like it's mm-hmm. the idea that most things take time to really develop. And I think the people that are driven and are fast day to day, but are patient long term are the ones that succeed because it's mm-hmm. like your day to day, you got to go. You can't procrastinate. Right. But you're, you're not procrastinating a goal that's 10 years down the road. You're realistic and saying, no, 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 it'll take me 10 years to hit it. But every day I'm doing small little things that seem right. insignificant. Like you going to work every day and doing what you do every day is not earth shattering. And someone's like, oh my God, Liz, you, you're like crushing it. You're like, no, she answered some calls. She met with some people. She did her day-to-day stuff. Right. But 10 years of doing that, you're like, oh my God. Like yeah, you're like on another like <laughs> level at that point. Yeah, it's kind of amazing how that happens. To be honest, it's like even just being seven years in, and where we are today, and the number of companies we have working with us, the number of people we have working with us, the the amount of you know business that there is to generate, and more that comes in the door every day, is really it's almost impossible to even wrap your mind around because, like you just said, we're just going to work every day. Mm-hmm. We're not setting out. You know, in some ways we are because we're doing all the little things in between to get there. But we're not going to work today saying we're going to land new five new clients today. Mm -hmm. But that might be where we end the day. You know, we might have gotten five new clients or or started, you know, with new business with companies we didn't even know were looking for help. Well, one one of the things, again, going back to your notes here, um, you said life's a series of decisions and circumstances that you can't always control. Um, can you speak a little bit more about kind of what you said, like business, obviously your life, like you, 
Like you didn't go to Buenos Aires and you went to Mexico like right. that. You know what I mean? Like now you yeah. met someone that's a good friend now and who knows, maybe you wouldn't, I don't know. Like exactly. the world's an unknown thing, but <laughs> can you kind of talk about how that's so far in your life, you know, personal, business, school, all that, how that's Oh yeah. Transpired. I mean, that's another like six hours, but yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Take as much as you want. You're, you're fine. <laughs> no, we, um, you know, David and I say that every, all the time, it's like, the reason we met is is so wild and bizarre in the sense that neither of us set out in life to end up back in Plattsburgh mm -hmm. or thinking we were going to be here. You know, we both went. We didn't know each other growing up, first of all. And is we, David from the area? He grew up until either 7th or 8th grade in Binghamton. Okay. And then moved to Plattsburgh. I know he's told me this before, but yeah. okay. Yeah. So then he was here through high school, end of middle okay. school, all of high school. At and PHS also? At, no, Poole? he was at Beekman Town. He was Beekman? Oh, I didn't know yeah. that. Okay. Yep. And then he went to Plattsburgh State. Okay. So he stayed Starting in Starting to come Plattsburgh. back to me a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he actually said, you know, we should do this together because we would bounce off each other. It would probably the podcast? be fun. Yeah. We'll probably be back. D David's one of my favorite guests. Like, I, I actually haven't had him on in a while. And yeah. I thought of him, but then I'm like, you know what? Sorry, David. Oh. But I was like, I haven't had Liz on, so I'm, I'm giving well, you the boot for right now. Yes. <laughs> He's way more interesting. Um, it, it, de it depends. But... <laughs> they're, they're both good. I, again, I love Dave. He's, He's we'll fun. have him back on for sure. Yeah. Um, but so we, yeah, we met out of like a series of events that were not planned and that neither of us sought out in our lives, but we ended up meeting each other in Plattsburgh, like we said, through, um, Stephen Bailey yeah. and, yeah. you know, we have our, our family, we have our business, we have, you know, each other. And so, you know, that in and of itself is an example of how, you know, different life circumstances and either it's decisions that you make or things that come across your path bring you to a new course and and you run with it and here you are i think oftentimes you end up in a better position than had you planned it um are you do you ever second guess decisions you make all the time you do okay every single one <laughs> like big decisions small decisions all like all of them um Pretty much all of them. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm like my own worst enemy. I question everything. You know, I analyze things. I run through things in my head. I, I just I do. It's just part of who I am. It's funny because <laughs> I would have guessed the answer would have been no because you've done like so much. But <laughs> like like I guess what I'm saying like if you like once I make a decision I don't dwell on like should I made the other decision like I'm, I I I will think before I make a decision. Yeah. But then once I make a decision then I'm like decisive of like, that's my decision. And then if it's wrong, then I'm like, like, I think, I think I have enough acceptance to myself to be like, that's what I decided in the moment. Yep. And that's what I get. Like, right. I'm not like, oh, well, if I would have had more information or would have been smarter or would have had more whatever, mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, what? I, I didn't at that point in time and I'm okay with that. Right. So I, I think I've been very comfortable with decisions and I haven't, like, you'd always look back and like, yeah, that would have been fun to like, some of the stuff you said, I'm like, that would have been fun to go to Europe, but that would have been fun to go away for college or do stuff. And mm -hmm. but I'm like, at the time, I didn't want to, and I'm totally fine with that decision. Right. Like, I don't dwell that I didn't like spend time, more time on campus or with kids. Like, I didn't meet anybody in college, and like, that's never affected my life. Right. I'm like, right. I'm good. I'm like, yeah, I guess I should say the big decisions I've made in my life, I never have looked back. Okay. You know, those are the decisions to move across the country the multiple times that I did. I never did that wondering if I made the right decision. I just ran with it and, and it was what it was. Um, and I've never regretted any of those decisions. But I think it's more the day to day. Like if okay. I, you know, I get nervous talking in front of people, right? So I will think about this podcast tonight when I'm going to bed. I'll think <laughs> I should have answered differently. I shouldn't have said this. I should have said well, the, that. The 500,000 people that will watch this episode. Will... Yes. You have a big following. <laughs> Not that many. There's a few zeros <laughs> off of that. But it's, it's uh, um, no, but I think, um, you know, the big things in life, like going into business, like should I have done that? Or even like people like, you know, obviously you're meeting like a spouse is like a big event, but people like I met my wife randomly. Like I didn't know she was bumped into her like, yeah. and it wasn't even like, like love at first sight thing. It was like, no, we hung out for a handful of months, but like not even that we like, we didn't start hanging out for months after when we first met. And then we weren't even hanging out one-on-one. -on -one. It was like with groups of people. And then we just kind of like, oh, like I kind of like this girl. And like, yeah. And then, but like things all happen for a reason. Like I never looked at him like, oh, well, like we always like, or at least I think about it. I'm like, 
man, there's times I knew about her before we were actually like dating or doing anything. I was like, oh, that's going to be my wife and have kids with her. Like never crosses my right, mind. Right. But it's yeah. just funny how like life opens up and I'm like, I couldn't even imagine things without her, you know, yeah. but it's just a weird, it's weird how it all just happens. I know. Or like, I know. like, uh, like you guys getting in or at least you getting into recruiting, mm-hmm. like, Right. That's not I'm sure you set out be like, I want to be a recruiter. Right. A no, no. I did probably know most of my life that I wanted to have a business. I didn't know what I would be doing. Mm-hmm. I didn't know I'd be doing it with my husband and partner in life. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew that I wanted to have a business. I wanted to I I don't know. I just always was drawn to it. Like I said, I just didn't know what it was. So there's no part of me that feels like, ooh, did we do the right thing? Um, we absolutely hundred percent did the right thing. We want to do more of it. So that's a good sign, right? (laughs) Well, yeah. And did you like not, um, like when you, so you started your like entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial journey with a partner. Mm -hmm. Did, was that, did, was that what maybe gave you the push to do it? Or was it the actual idea of what was going on that gave you the push? Like, cause some people with entrepreneurs, like I know people that, I think would be very good entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. but they're scared because it's not easy. And like you basically are now responsible for all your success, you know, and like it's, it's just, there's no direction. Like you can go and work for somebody and they're going to kind of tell you what to do and there's structure and semi-structure in place. Mm -hmm. And then when you're just on your own, you got to be very disciplined because you're creating the structure and then you also have to keep yourself playing in that like space and keep you on like the straight and narrow versus... You know, some people get into it and they just, the time freedom is what is what draws them, but it's also what gets them out of it because they can't control that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that we probably keep each other engaged and we keep each other, you know, positive and, and staying in it. Um, certainly the family and the kids and mm-hmm. most of what we do revolves around our, our children and our family, but, but we really like the business. You know, we have some clients that, that now I've been working with for seven years that David's been working with for I don't even know. I should know. <laughs> but let's just throw out a number, maybe 20 years. Oh, wow. Okay. And yeah. um, and they, you know, they're, they're, they're more than clients. It's more than business. You know, it's a small community when mm-hmm. you look at the business community and the people that we've developed relationships with and that David feels very close with and that I, you know, have the good fortune of also feeling close to, um, you know, people even going through their retirement now, reaching back out to us to have conversations with us because they did so much business with us when they were working. Mm-hmm. That's nice. It feels nice. You know, it's like yeah. we're the people they're reaching out to. And that's because we developed something more than just a working relationship with these people. Um, was that, again, being in, I mean, because you guys have clients for like a long period of time. Like, mm-hmm. um, was that something that you set out or was that just like a byproduct? Like, obviously, you know, it, it, if you're doing well, it's probably going to trend that direction. But was that like a major focus of yours or was that as you just kind of went over the years, it just naturally developed and blossomed into more than just like a transactional relationship? I think it's natural. I think that in the line of work that, that we're in, um, you know, there's there's so much that goes into it. We're dealing with people's lives. We're helping people find work. We're helping employers find people that they want to rely on and count on and need in order to be successful in, in their business. And, um, and I think that there's a lot of trust that goes into that. And there's a relationship that is built out of that. That's more than just, you know, a, a business, a client and a transaction. But, you know, I, this way I think it comes naturally. How, um, kind of like, I guess some shop questions here. If you, if someone was like, hey, I'm going to hire a recruiting like firm or an organization versus just trying to hire internally, like how does that work? Or if you look at, you know, and I don't know if this is a client, but there was a big, we were at a career fair this morning and there was a big local company that this person worked in HR and recruiting. So like, are they doing that internally on their own? Or are they hiring out a company like yours to assist with that? A lot of times they're doing both. Okay. Uh, most of our clients also have the ability certainly to hire on their own but they recognize that it takes a lot of the legwork out of their job to Mm -hmm. work with us you know we're meeting people all day every day and we're meeting people who maybe they apply to work say with you you Mm -hmm. know they want to come in they want to work with you but they have nothing that qualifies them to work with you today maybe Mm -hmm. you'll look at them in six months or however long it takes them to get up to speed But for us, we have, okay, so you want to work with Galen, but you're not ready. But we have this other client 
who you are ready to work for. Mm -hmm. And we can connect you over there. Whereas the client side of that, if that person just came to you and you got really excited about them and then realized they're not ready for six months, now you're sitting there thinking, oh, geez, I, you know, now I've got to go back out and meet more people. So if we're just bringing you the people that we're saying, Galen, these are good fits. Betting on the- you know, yeah, here's six people. You pick the one you want to work with. Yeah. It's a lot easier for the businesses to work with us, even though they might have someone walk in the door that's perfect. It can save them a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy to just work with us. <laughs> yeah. No, it makes sense. I mean, it's the uh, it's kind of the same thing like in our business. Like I'm like, you can sell your own home, but then it's like, do you, you got to look at it. Number one, you have to now do everything that you're probably not equipped to, or well equipped to do. Mm-hmm. And then you also have the idea, like I tell people right now in this market, like for sale, but I'm like, absolutely, go put a sign out. You probably will sell it. But then like, are you maximizing the actual price or the or the convenience or the terms of what you're dealing with because yes someone will buy it but then it's like if you don't have the exposure if you're not maximizing you know the eyeballs and you're not uh, maximizing the um potential amount of buyers mm-hmm. like are you driving up the price to where it should be sure. there's a difference between like sell it's probably the same in yours a difference between like hiring on someone and hiring on the correct person or hiring on someone maybe where all your uh you know you know, all the, I'm going to say the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted where some you bring them on and you're like, oh, I didn't realize that these three things and that's now not great. And right. then you're like, oh yeah, we would have taken care of that three steps ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, and most of the time, if they're using our services for contract to hire, which basically means there are employee working for you for a period of time, mm-hmm. it's like a working interview. You get to work with that individual. They get to work with you. If it's not a great fit, no harm, no foul. They were our employee. We'll help them find other work mm-hmm. and we'll help you find another employee. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, I mean, it's not an industry I know very well, but I mm-hmm. think it's like, it's any kind of service industry. It's like, if you pay people that just understand it better, it's yeah. more of the, um, <clears throat> cause again, I've talked about like now I've, I've gotten more on my plate and stuff. Like I, I look at everything from a financial, a time and an energy standpoint, like because it's not just like like time. I'm like, yeah, but it takes me this much time and or money. I mean, it takes me this much money, um, but it takes me this much time, and then physically, like it drains me, like energy wise. Like right. that's a that's a very like that's not a big like that's got to be recharged back up. So if like every day to day your energy is just being drained, I'm like that's probably something you shouldn't be doing because it's like right. ugh, like I hate like if you hate doing it, it's like, yeah, like podcasts. <laughs> like I don't want to outsource this. I like doing podcasts, but so yeah. there's certain things I'm like. Ugh, I don't want to do that, and and uh, but that's just being aware of yourself. Um, so let me see. You talked about being positive every day. I know you talked again. You talked about David doing that, but what mm-hmm. what role does positivity play in your life, both professional and on the uh, you know the business side, or professional and on the personal side? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> and I said this, but you know, David always says to me, "You hear yourself." So the words that you're using matter. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I kind of keep that in my head at all times, you know, when I'm talking or when I'm writing an email or when I'm speaking with my kids, I really try to remove the negative. Um, you know, when we have marketing and, uh, we're creating new ads or we have, we've worked with multiple, you know, individuals, we've hired people internally to work with us in marketing and they come up with these great ads. And sometimes it might say like, don't do this. And I always say, stop, stop, stop. We're not going to say don't. We're going to say do. Tell people what we want them to do, not what we don't want them to do. It leaves too much question. I think, you know, staying on the positive and and being helpful to people and keeping that good vibe out there brings back good energy to you and to us. And so I don't know. It's just something I've always believed in. Yeah, like we, I mean, from like a positivity standpoint, I like I'm human. I have down days, I have low energy days. So like overall, I would say I'm pretty optimistic and I try to, I catch myself too. And there's days where I'll do something. I'm like, I'm like, well, like, are you in your head a lot? You said you think a lot. Oh yeah. Like I, you talk to yourself. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, I say talk to yourself, but like mentally you're having like this dialogue and there, I would say every day and most things I do, I'll stop me like, you know, don't do that. Do this. Okay, that was good. Like, and, and some days I'll pump up and be like, wow, that was like you. That was a really good appointment or a really good podcast or whatever. Right. And then there's sometimes like, man, like you just like, man, your energy was low with Liz. Like, you know what? What caused that? Or what could you do better? Or you know, was it? You know, it, like I have these things in my head, and sometimes they're small, but I'm not. I'm not dwelling. Like I'm just gonna right. use this example and be like, ah, oh, I was really. I didn't show up for that podcast with Liz. I was just kind of like, you know, just very 
nothing. There was not a lot of energy, <laughs> low energy, whatever. I'm and sorry. No, no, and it's not. No, but, but I feel. I feel this is good. I'm yeah, saying yeah, like yeah, that yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna pick on you. I'll be like, wow, oh, man. Like I. It's usually not the guest. It's like, and even if I have a guest on here that's not like high energy, mm-hmm. I can still do enough to maybe pull out some energy sure. or drive the conversation, whatever. Most yeah. most time these flow easy. But I, I will think about it, but I won't think about it and be like, oh my God, I have to apologize to Liz because I was terrible. I'm like, no, it is what it is. Right. But now I'm like, okay, maybe I didn't eat and maybe I didn't eat before this. Maybe yeah. I, you know, didn't get enough sleep. Like I think about these things and I'm like, well, I'll change that so then I show up better. Right. But I have these conversations and it's not to change the past, it's to learn and change the future. And I do that constantly throughout the day yep <laughs> like to the point where i'm like i feel like i don't see like a therapist or whatever but i almost feel like i need to see one because i talk to my head i talk to my head all the time. Like i do that. it too though no yeah, just, i do it all the time that's why when you asked me earlier do you question things i'm like all the time because i run yeah. through things but and it's I not think like about question things. with regret it's like question no to learn. it's not yeah it's not okay. a regretful thing it's more of like i run through it i try to figure it out i try to do better I'm always thinking about, you know, what I'm going to do next time I'm presented with this situation, how I handled this one. It's like watching game film from the game the day before. Yeah. It's like, oh, I missed that play or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Nothing you can do. It's, you can't go back, but no, you can go forward. And, and, and what I think some people get too stuck up in the past where like they regret something. I'm like, I don't really have regrets no. because like, and I've screwed up a ton. I screw up every day and I'm like, but it, I just yeah. know I'll not make that mistake again. Right. And, right. you know, well, and you hope that you get better. And it's like everything else we've talked about. We're here because of all the decisions we've made, you know, all of those life circumstances and things that we accomplished or obstacles we overcame brought us to here today. So yeah, I don't look back and regret any of that. I'm really happy where I am today. Yes. As, as am I, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> uh, so no, I think, I think that's great. And so, and there's a couple others I want to get kind of on business, more mindset stuff. And then we'll go into some fun little stories here that you, uh, <laughs> that you added. So I should have just bulleted this and not. No, well, so you much. did. I'm just like I'm jumping. I'm going like from work. Um, top. Okay. I love that. I'm pretty sure I have an MBA. I always wanted, just not the way I envisioned it. Yeah. Though I always knew I would own a business one day. So, because again, you guys are in the business of recruiting or in the business of jobs. How much does just on the like just experience matter and stuff? Oh well. You know, I think it matters a great deal. In, and I'm not saying in this, years of experience, but more of just experiencing things. Like, yep, yep. I think that when you meet people, you need to be able to relate to them. Mm-hmm. And people come to us from all walks of life every day, and they've been through all sorts of things. A lot of things that I've never been through, but I've been through my own experiences. I've had my own, you know, obstacles or or whatever it is I've experienced in life. And I can somehow relate to what these people are going through, whether it was they have lost their job or they need to change their jobs or they're going through a divorce and now they're a single parent and need to make more money or, you know, all sorts of reasons that people come to us and and want to change jobs or they, you know, need a new job or they need a job period. Maybe they were incarcerated and now they're sitting in our lobby looking for help. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that life experiences help us to be one more relatable to them, but to, um, try to put yourself in their shoes and understand where they're coming from. You know, in our line of work, meeting people day in, day out, we are, you know, David says all the time, like we need to people meet people where they are. Um, It's really just a matter of being understanding, being open, listening. And all of that I think comes through life experiences. Um, So when you have like uh, dealing with so many different people and, and kind of like, and again, People that work's a big thing in people's lives. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's, and I would say most people spend more time at work than they do even, sure. you know, not sleeping, but just like out of work for the yeah. most part. Um, what's, what do you find are the main reasons that people come to you for maybe switching jobs or looking for a job? Like you said, someone's incarcerated and comes out. Like, that's a different, obviously, that's a pretty sure. extreme example. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, what, what do you find that, like, hey, this is really the main themes of why people come and see us? I think a lot of times it's that people are looking for something different. You know, see, people are looking to make a difference or to do something that they feel is more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's different. That can be something different for different people. You know, working in a a pick pack environment to someone who really desires to be in an office setting, 
that might not be attractive to them. But to someone else, that might be a dream job. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone's been working in retail and dealing with the public, they might look at a scenario in a warehouse where they're packaging for shipments and, and think that's, uh, that's an amazing job mm -hmm. and a perfect fit for them. Mm -hmm. So it's different for everyone. But I think that, uh, that yeah, the reasoning is, is oftentimes because somebody is looking for something that feels more meaningful to them. Yeah, like fulfillment of like whatever. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say like some days I see people just like driving around on like a lawnmower, and I'm like, that just sounds like a great job. For you. you know, when I feel <laughs> yeah, like deal with people yeah. and you're just like, mind racing, I'm like, I, we just, <laughs> right. I just want to like, like really like mindlessly just do something that I don't have to think, and I can just like mm -hmm. listen to a podcast and just chill. Yeah. And I don't want people like complaining right. or arguing, or I'm like, I just exactly. want to just chill out today. <laughs> um, and then I know after a day I'll be like, God, I gotta go back. Like, right. I, I can't, I can't just sit here. <laughs> you need to be around people. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so a couple things like things that. You you value, you put time, everything in moderation, be open, listen, understand, and feel what others are experiencing, which you kind of just talked about, mm -hmm. and then no room for drama, can't dwell and move on. So kind of dive through those a little bit as to, you know, how those fit into your life. And a lot of those seem, you know, kind of professional. I'm sure they, they leak into the, the personal side too. Yeah. I mean, I think that time is, is a big one. It's, um, it's so... It's so hard to to put a finger on how how much it means and how important it is and how quickly it it disappears. You know, I have a, a my oldest son who's a In college. He's yeah, at. he just finished his freshman year. That's insane. You know, Where, I, where's he go? He's at University of Buffalo. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, yeah. forever away. <laughs> that's, I was gonna say that's pretty far. It's far. <laughs> um, but it amazes me. I mean, I have these pictures around the house of, or they pop up on my phone in my memories of when he was three years old or yeah. five years old, all those. And it's just impossible to think about like those days are gone, you know? And it just, to me, the, the, the time, it, as I get older, I think it's more and more valuable and it means so much more to me. Do you, and this is selfishly asking, because I, I have young kids. I'm on the complete opposite end of the yeah. spectrum. We just celebrated my daughter's uh, fourth birthday on Aww. Sunday. And, like, I look at him, like, I can't believe she's four. Yeah. Which, I mean, obviously your son, like, 18, is, like, like blink Insane. of an eye. Yeah. Um, do you find that, like, time passes quicker as you get older? Oh, yeah. Okay. Because, yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard people say that, and I'm, like, you're experiencing it now, and I don't know if that's, like, obviously it doesn't. It's just our relationship to time, but I feel like maybe, is it because of our memory? I, like, it's stronger? I think that, for me, it's, like, a matter of perspective, I just feel like I have an entirely different handle on my life and where I'm at in my life and, and you know, what's left to my life. Many <laughs> years, <laughs> yes. And, um, and I didn't have that when I was younger and when the kids were younger. It was really, a lot of it felt like survival mode most of the time. You know, where do I have to be? When do I have to be there? Who needs what? And someone needs a snack and someone needs a nap and someone needs a diaper change and you know, yeah. all of that. So, you know, I think you have you have more time to think about it, perhaps a different perspective. And you recognize how quickly it goes. And uh, and the experience of having an 18 year old who I feel like was for yesterday. Yeah. You know, where did that time go? And so it's just so precious. Um, like when you talk like day to day and, and we're so driven by like our calendars and so driven by like um like time of a, like we got to be there we got to like i you know i see like you and obviously i work with jen and like kids got sports and stuff yes. and i look at my kids i'm like even just dropping them off at you know preschool and picking them up from preschool and you're just constantly like, doing stuff mm -hmm. do you find um you know at the stages of your life with the stages that the kids are in or were in that you were like able to like slow down and enjoy the moment or was that something that came natural like i find for me i have to actively like fo force myself to do that like yeah. nope just pause and there's some days like it might be a saturday and i'm like you know what i'm just gonna chill today mm -hmm. like i know that like that yard work's not gonna get done or maybe something's not gonna get done but i'm like i have really nothing i just want to hang out and lay on the floor and play with my kid or yeah. just like you know do whatever so whatever they find fun yeah like i did does that come natural to you or did was that something that you had to actively be like that self-talk of like, no, no, like today is just going to be a me kid day. Yeah, no, I think that it absolutely has to be something that you stop and tell yourself in the moment to do, at least for me, similar to you. Um, I think it's easy to get caught up in the day to day and what needs to get done and where you need to be. But asking yourself why, 
you know, why does that need to get done? Why, you know, yes, the neighbors might be looking at me sideways if my lawn is a foot long, but <laughs> that can wait. You know, there's going to be nap time and there's going to be play dates and there will be times that I can find to get the lawn done. Mm-hmm. Um, but this time is slipping away. You know, I to any parent with young children right now, yourself included, I would say you have to stop and enjoy these moments because you'll remember this conversation when they're 18 and older and away from home saying, I really wish, I mean, I, I truly wish at times, we talked about regrets and not having them. I, I, I do at times sit and think I should have enjoyed those moments more than I know I did at the time. I, uh, well, and I remember, so you know Aaron Benner? Yeah. So he's a good good friend of mine. Yeah. And he always tells me, like, just randomly. Like, and, and, and he's like a brother. He's he's great. But he, uh, he'll he get, like, very serious. And, like, he goes, hey, GT. He goes, you know, don't, don't. What, what do you say? Basically, like, don't, um, like, spend time with your kids. Like, yeah. don't just, like, let it pass by. And he tells me all the time. And I think um, something I've, as I got kids, like, I busted my tail when I first got in the business. And, like, I worked very hard. And I, you know, did a lot of stuff. And. Um, and I, and I knew too, as I was starting to have kids that I had to like, now was the time to like grind out and like overwork and do mm-hmm. all this stuff. And I even did it a bit when my oldest was very young Yeah, and which was fine. I mean, he's, a, he's a, in, in, I saw a ton of them, but I'm saying I didn't, he wasn't going anywhere. He was at home. He was right. napping. Like, sure. um, so I really did a lot of like burning the candle at both ends a bit mm-hmm. but i knew i had to do that because i knew i was going to have kids more kids and knew you know not knowing but kind of knowing like you kind of feel like everybody talks about not having time and just life gets crazy and i well yes that, mm-hmm. that is true but um i found that my focus then was is way different than it is now so i'm putting a lot more emphasis on kids i'm putting more emphasis on like being there for my family like today someone called me up and was like hey you want to fill in on one of our golf teams? We'd love for you to play. I'm like, great. What day is it? They told me the day. I'm like, what day of the week is that? They're like, Sunday. I'm going to come out. Like that was yeah. it was even a question of like, let me see. I'm like, no, Sunday. I'm chilling with the kids, and my right. wife. Like, but I, uh, but now I'm like for work. I spend more time focusing on effectiveness and efficiencies in my job, and focusing on like, okay, I, I don't need to go 100. I can go 70 mm-hmm. because I want that 30 percent to add on to family. Like I want to pull like from the work bucket and put it into the family bucket more. And I right. So I would say I don't – I really don't have regrets where my mindset's at. I mean, I don't have regrets, period, but, like, I don't – my mindset is in the right place. It's yeah. just, like, I think it's, like, ah, I wish I could just perfect this a little bit more. But then I realize you talk to everybody, like, you just – you never do. It's right. just, like, because the kids get older, <laughs> like, you know, now they're playing sports, and now they're doing this. They're oh, off to yeah. college, and you just – you know, parenting is just, like you said, it's a series of, like, you know – things in your life but really it's just a series of trial and error because right. you don't know what you're doing right and it and, oftentimes is unpredictable you don't know yeah. what's around the corner and so you you really have to just enjoy the moments that you know you have and i love that you said no on a sunday because i think when my kids were that age i wasn't doing that and when we were starting courier staffing in the first several years when my now 18 year old who i keep talking about was the age of my now 12 year old um <laughs> He, you know, we didn't make the time to go see his games at 4.30 because the office was open till 5.30. Mm-hmm. And so now we're doing that. And yeah. we can't get that time back with him, but we cannot make that mistake this time. Mm-hmm. And so that's the, we don't have dwelling on that, but we are changing it for our younger son. And we're trying to get to all the 4.30 games and we're getting into the office a little earlier and we always work late anyway. And, you know, we're working on the weekends and all that, but we're not physically out, you know, we're present in his life, maybe more than we were for our older son at that time. I think you learn too. And like, you know, say, say your oldest son has, you know, kids in the future and your grandkids, like, you're like, up, oh, not missing a game. Like, I mean, right. you, you, I think it's like, I try to, you know, learn about a lot of stuff. And I think, um, you know, just getting home earlier for me has like been a priority of like not staying and working till seven, eight o'clock at night. Yeah. And you get them every once in a while, but they're now the exception or not the rule where right. back then was the rule. Like now I'm really kind of wrapping up my day. Like today I have an appointment. Actually, I should watch my time here. I got an appointment <laughs> about 25 minutes, but that I'll probably be done by five. I'll be home by like five thirty, five forty-five. 45. Yeah. And you know, for me on a, on a Tuesday, that's not bad. And usually, you know, most of the other days I'm pretty good. So right. it's just a, it's a, yeah, it's a learning curve, but I feel like, my mindset's in the right place. Like I'm very aware of it now where I could yeah. go like 10 years and then start thinking about it. When my kids are, you know, 
say 10, 11, 12, 13, I'm like, oh my God, like why wasn't I doing more when they were little kids? And I feel like that's something that, at least for me, it's good, but it, you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Right. Like, hope, I mean, hopefully it's good. I feel like I'm, I'm glad I'm thinking about this stuff. I'm not, I haven't perfected anything by any means, but it's like, at least I'm working at that yeah. portion of my life, which. That's all um, you can do. Exactly. Right. Um, all right. A couple rapid fire questions <laughs> just to make sure I'm. Uh, if I'm anyone's sure. li- still listening, right? If, you... <laughs> if anybody's still listening. Um, let me see. Rapid fire questions. And I don't, I don't want to do like word associations. I'm going to let you talk a little bit about the, they're like <laughs> this. That, like David, he's great. Um, but David's great. The uh, uh, okay. So okay, mo- I've said it before. Motorcycle license. Mm-hmm. Give give me a. You <laughs> nev- so you got a motorcycle license so, or have one? Yes. When I was uh, one of the moves back and forth across the country, I was working at a boarding school in Massachusetts, all boys school. I was a young 20-something-year-old woman who, you know, was not in a relationship and was just working my life away. I mean, we worked 24-7. We'd get, like, a 24-hour period off, like, every two weeks or something. Wow. And uh, and we just lived there on campus. And my my doors were open to these kids pretty much 24-7, 24, you know, almost 7. And... Um, and they, uh, they, I just didn't have much going on for myself. And so getting my motorcycle license was just something that I decided to do. There was someone else on campus that had a motorcycle. And I thought, oh, I could probably do that. And at least I'd have somebody to ride with, you know. So I went and I took a motorcycle safety course. And uh, and, and I just did it. I mean, I kind of made a fool of myself a couple times, but I passed the course. You did the figure eight? <laughs> yes, I did the figure eight. Um I did all all the different things uh, that you had to do, and went for a couple rides here and there. And so, have you uh, driven a motorcycle since? Not since that point of time in my life. <laughs> Would you get a motorcycle? So, um, yeah, I mean, in fact, when I left for my second move across the country to California, I was in the process of buying a motorcycle, but this job opportunity came up in Idlewild, California. So I said, "All right, I'll buy the I'll buy the motorcycle when I get out to California instead." And I got out to California and I was living on at 5,000 feet, well, more like 6,000 feet of a 13,000 foot mountain peak. Okay. And so, and the road was like windy all the way down the mountain. And I said, oh, maybe I won't get the motorcycle now. <laughs> it's probably not smart. I mentioned earlier, I'm a little clumsy, probably a death sentence. So I waited and said, oh, I'll do it another time. And then of course it never happened. Okay. Oh, that's, so. <laughs> that's cool. Um, all right. And let me see. Oh, that's so funny. I'm just going to, you don't have to explain this, yeah, but I yeah. just think this is great. Rode bikes everywhere and hung out the West End Park until dark, until parents would start the phone chains and someone would tell us we all had to be home. Yes. That does, that like is old school as it gets <laughs> right now. Like most my... kids now would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. They're like, yep. yeah. That was the, my whole childhood. Streetlight went on. Oh, yeah. shoot. <laughs> um, so you, you big in skiing. Yep. Do you still ski? I still ski. I'm not brave anymore. Um, I was brave my whole life up until I had kids and then I just lost it. And I remember the first time I realized I was not brave anymore. I was on a mountain with David and it got icy and I looked at him and I said, I'm not going down this. And he's like, you got to get down. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I went down on my butt because <laughs> wow. I just said, I'm not, I'm just not there anymore. So do you and uh, Dave see it all now? Yes. Yep. We ski. Both of our kids ski. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I started skiing when I was three years old. And so our kids both started when they were three as well. Oh, nice. And do you guys go like travel for skiing at all? We haven't done much. We have, we talk about going to Colorado for Christmas every year and then we don't do it. So one of these years we'll do it or or somewhere. David has a bunch of places, you know, I was going to say, but then like, like, I have a boat to go to Mexico. (laughs) Yes. Um, And walker, skier, boater, I was going to say you and Dave boat. We boat, we walk every single day, like I said, with our dogs. We, uh, we're we pretty active. And obviously kid stuff, Little League, Little League Treasurer. I know you're with uh, the Community Action Angels Backpack Program. That's... Um, oh, I love that Actually, I should, I should do a shout out. You guys also very graciously sponsor our For the Kids Golf Tournament every yes. year, which, um, which is the backpack program is, I think, has been a recipient of that for, I think we've done four years now. Yeah. They've been every year. Um it's just such I guess a wonderful... talk about the backpack program quick. We'll give them a plug because I don't, yeah. some people don't know what it is. <laughs> it's such a wonderful program. Um, 
It's uh, it's it provides food to food insufficient homes um, every week throughout the school year. And the um, Community Action Angels is a, an organ, a group of individuals who um, also contribute our time and our energy and our voice to helping those individuals or other individuals in the community who are also food insufficient um, throughout the summer. We also help out with the summer lunch programs at the parks and serve the food, and we volunteer that time as well. Um, so, I mean, as long as I've known both of you, you and David are both very involved in the community, both very involved in charities and, <laughs> yes. and, and time and money and everything else. So um, was that something that um, was ingrained at a young age? Is that something that part of your you know vision of was like, hey, we're going to be very involved and give back to the community? I mean, yeah. you, guys, you guys, like I said, more than like talk, you walk the walk kind of stuff. Yeah. So. I mean, both of us, I can't even say it's like a plan. We don't really talk about it in the sense that it's something we need to do. It's just something we do. Yeah. So again, it goes with like walking the walk and just doing something versus talking about something. Um, you know, the, the Community Action Angels, the backpack program came so naturally to me when I found out about it and learned about it. It was because... I was picking up my son from school, bringing him to the STEM program from Oak Street School to the middle school. I don't even know if they have that anymore. Mm-hmm. But I would take a car full of kids every week and drop them off at the middle school. And this one day, this little boy got in. It was a Friday, and he needed his backpack. And the kids were asking him, why do you have two backpacks? Why do you go get that other backpack every week? And he was, like, so excited to tell him. He's like, oh, it's really cool. I get this food, and I bring it home and I have for the weekend, sometimes I get a jar of peanut butter, I sometimes I get bread and get noodles or sauce or you know, you name it. And the kids were like, Oh, that's cool. And I and everybody just obviously thought it, over at, at that age over their heads a bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I'm sitting there driving Very like innocent. almost in tears, like, is this yeah. really happening? And so I said something to David and he found out about it at the United Way and then he connected me with at the time Megan Tedford. Yep. Who um who immediately that's the past, yeah. Oh I know, yeah. I love her. Yeah. I immediately hooked up with her and we became great friends. And so I got right on the Community Action Angels and have been involved ever since. Yeah. No, that's, I was going to say that I've learned about it yeah, over the years in some facet or another. But now, like, I did it before, like, I knew about it prior to kids. But now that you have kids, it's like, yeah. okay, like stuff like, like, I think that's the thing that, why I love our golf tournament, like for the kids, but it's like, when you start having kids, like your perspective changes and now oh, you yeah. just, you're more in tune with kids. Like, oh my gosh. You know, yeah. I just, uh, yeah, like I said, it's just, kids are great. And then you see my kids like, or see your, like your, like your actual kids, but see their friends and then just kind yeah. of put it all together and like, okay, like they're just little people, but they're fun and they're having, right. you know, little innocent kids and, right. you know, just trying to, you know, life's hard, but not, let's not make it hard for the kids and let them you exactly. know, enjoy it. So yeah. And our kids have no idea how good they have it, you know, and that's how yeah. it should be. They don't yeah. know. And, uh, and they look at everybody equally and, mm-hmm. you know, if we can do anything to help out other families and other kids in the community, then, you know, we'd be crazy not to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Liz, I'm going to wrap it up there because, Perfect. which was great. That's like I said, time <laughs> actually flew by and actually I'm glad <laughs> I had this up, the computer up, I didn't see the time, but um, if anybody wants to find, I mean, obviously, how do they reach Coyer Staffing? Oh, give, Coyer just Staffing. Give a little, little yeah, yeah, plug. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can find us in many, many places. Um, our website is CoyerStaffing.com. We have a LinkedIn page. We have a Facebook page, Instagram, um, Twitter. Um, what else is out there, Galen? You I, tell me. <laughs> TikTok. Is there a video of Dave t- TikToking out there? You know what? Dancing? That I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> um but yeah, we're we're available, reachable. You can call us. You can uh, find us pretty much anywhere. Three two four five six seven eight. Really hard to forget that number. <laughs> um, and and also, this is for people that are looking for employment in um, employers that are looking for yep. employees. Yep. So exactly. Both sides. We also have a Vermont office too. We didn't talk about oh, that, right. but it's eight zero two eight two eight seven eight two eight. Is the number for that. But you can yes. find us on our website for Vermont as well. I was going to say, you guys, you guys are doing very well. So, uh, yeah. well, Liz, this was great. Yeah, thank you so much. I was, I was gonna, and, and again, I like I said, if this was an eight-hour podcast, I had a lot more follow-up <laughs> questions. More I'm like going about. through them like, ah, yeah, that'd be good. That'd I be don't good. know if it's but, all fun, but hey, we had I, fun. I, 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 I don't know what it is, but I find it very interesting to learn about people. Yeah. Next time so, I get to interview you, you'll be in the nobody's hot Nobody's ever done that. I think a couple of people have asked me, um, World Series and Super Bowl. Yeah, that's right, San Diego. Yeah. Wait, Super Bowl, ni- 1998. Yes. Was it in San Diego? Yes. Okay. I was going to say Denver won that one. But the World Series, that was the year the Padres won. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Swept the I was at the World Series. I had tickets to that. The, the right? They swept Super- the Yankees? Yes. Yeah. Yep. 
But at the Super Bowl, I was my office was next door. So we all had a party in the office and watched from the windows. We couldn't see the game, but we could see the blimp and the people and the tailgate. Do you remember who was Denver and who? Oh, I don't remember. Okay. I just remember it was back to back for Denver yeah. back then. I was I was a little guy, but I remember for some reason, like when you're a kid, you remember every sports stat in right. non existence. <laughs> but um, all right, we'll wrap right. it up there. That is episode, what is this, 233 of the Galen Trombley Drill. Galen. I should know my name by now. Galen Trombley Show. We're out. All right. Thanks. Thank you for listening to The Galen Trombley Show. Be sure to subscribe, review, and share the episode. You can follow me on all social platforms at Galen Trombley. Thanks for listening.